Well, hello there. This is Brian Denlinger, and uh, I just want to do a special study today. And I'm going to be calling this study Post-Tribulation Rapture Thieves. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Um, I've been having a lot of correspondence back and forth with people who do not believe in the pre-tribulation pre rapture. And indeed, they even classify it as some kind of a heresy or something. And and you're, you know, not preparing people for the tribulation if you teach it, that we're going to be raptured out of it and everything. And so this is kind of a strong rebuke, if you will, of those who know about the argument and persist in teaching the error that Christians, that the body of Christ goes through the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, you can listen to the other messages uh, that I've made on the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture uh, to get more details. And, and of course, you should listen to those if you believe in a post-tribulation uh, rapture or that there is no rapture. Please listen to the other messages first. Don't send me questions saying, well, what about this? What about that? Listen to the other messages first. If I haven't answered your question, then get back to me. But uh, this is going to be kind of a strong rebuke today. And um, if you're innocent and you really don't know a whole lot, well, it's not so much directed at you as it is directed mainly at those who are in ministry and that are persisting in teaching this falsehood of a that there is no rapture or that the rapture is at the end of the tribulation. And um the verse I want to read here quick is in John chapter 10 verse 10 it says the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now that that's Jesus Christ speaking and he identifies that a thief will do three things. They first they steal, then they kill, then they destroy. Okay, and I'm going to tell you right now that, that if these false prophets that are teaching a post-tribulation rapture or no rapture at all, that is exactly what they're doing. They are a thief. And you say, well, what do you mean by what do you mean by that? Well, how are they a thief? How is teaching a post-tribulation rapture? How does that make you a thief? Well, first of all, what they have to do in order to teach this, is they have to steal God's promises to Israel. And I'm going to show you a couple of different false prophets here. I'm actually going to play their recordings in this study. I'm going to let them speak for themselves, and, and you can check it out. You know, Make sure I'm not taking it out of context. But I'm actually going to let them speak, and you're going to see that they steal promises God made to Israel. Okay. Number two, they will kill your joy in the blessed hope. Okay, you're to, it's the rapture being taken out before the time of Jacob's trouble is a blessed hope. It's not about getting out of troubles and, and just never having any kind of persecution down here. That isn't it. The reason that it's a comfort is because we get to go see Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, and something's wrong with you if you're a Christian and you don't want to go and see Jesus Christ. Something's wrong there. You know, I've talked to people about the rapture and I say, you know, I think it's coming soon. Oh, no, no. Oh, I hope it doesn't happen soon. I'm going on vacation here in another couple of weeks. Oh, I hope the rapture doesn't happen before then. Boy, you know, we just got a new house, and I'm just starting to get situated. And, oh, you know, oh, man, I hope the rapture doesn't happen yet. <laughs> Something's wrong, if that's your philosophy. There should be nothing between you and Jesus Christ and wanting to see Him. Looking into the eyes of your Lord and your Savior, the one who died on the cross for you. Why wouldn't you want that today? Something's wrong with you if you don't want that. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that, in that, of that into this study. But number three, they will destroy your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, well, what, is, what do you mean by that? 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you love the appearing of Jesus Christ? You say, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to it. Okay, you're going to get a crown of righteousness at the judgment seat of Christ because your heart is in the right place. You say, no, I'd, I'd rather see the Antichrist and I'd rather see... You know, the mark of the beast and, and 
you know, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. Boy, I'm looking forward to that. You know, what about Jesus? Well, yeah, he'll come at the end, but man, I want to see all this other stuff. <laughs> okay, something's wrong with you. Revelation 3, 10 and 11 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Speaking of Bible-believing Christians being kept from the time of Jacob's trouble. And verse 11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And it's, it's very sickening and saddening to me to see that so many Bible-believing Christians that used to believe in a rapture and that used to believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to catch his bride away, they used to believe in it, and now they don't. And they're getting so messed up in other doctrines and just falling apart doctrinally. Why? Because some false prophet came and, and deceived them into thinking that they're going to have to endure to the end of the, the tribulation and that they might lose their salvation and you can't take the mark of the beast and you're going to have to survive for seven years of God's wrath. Just incredible. And they have lost their crown the crown of righteousness. They aren't going to be getting it because they don't love the appearing of Jesus Christ. They're look, looking forward to the appearing of the Antichrist and the New World Order and everything else. And that stuff's coming, but the Bible does teach, and like I said, listen to the other studies, the Bible does teach that the body of Christ is removed before the Antichrist shows up. Now, I'm going to play a couple of recordings here, like I said, uh, four different false prophets, and... Uh, they are all thieves, okay? And the first one that we're going to hear, uh, I'll, I'll play it here, and you can hear this is the first type of theft. I'm going to prove to you right now that that's not true from the Bible. And if you, if you have an honest heart, you look at what the Bible says, you'll, you'll see what I'm saying. Look at Matthew 24, verse number uh, 36. Okay, first thief, false prophet thief, is Steve Anderson. Okay, now... All post-tribulation rapture believers, every single one of them that I've ever discussed things with, they all go to Matthew chapter 24. Okay, now there's a number of problems with using Matthew chapter 24 to prove that Christians go through the tribulation. Okay, problem number one is Matthew chapter 24 is doctrinally in the Old Testament. You say, oh, but it's in the New Testament. No, it's in a collection of books called the New Testament. But doctrinally, it's in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 through 17 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. When did the New Testament begin? It did not begin in Matthew chapter 1. It began after the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not speaking to Christians in Matthew 24. He was speaking to Jews. Okay, you need to understand that. Problem number two, the seven-year period is more pro it's properly called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Okay, and, I, and again, I can't cover this whole thing. It takes too much time. Listen to the other messages, and you'll hear a lot more detail on this thing of, of this time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, it is for the nation of Israel. Jacob was called Israel by God. So when you read about Jacob's trouble, it's Israel's trouble. It's not the body of Christ's trouble. It's not the church's trouble. It's the Jews. And I know a lot of people have a real problem with that, that God's actually dealing with the nation of Israel with, you know, one nation. You know, they, well, that's racism and things. Yeah, pretty much so. God's dealing with the Jew. He's not dealing with the Gentile when the time of Jacob's trouble comes around. doesn't mean that Gentiles won't get saved in the tribulation time period, but God's focus turns from 
not being a respecter of persons today, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, all are one in Christ. He turns from that to the nation of Israel. And we're going to see a little bit more on that, on that in detail here as we continue on. Problem number three with using Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So you have a faith plus works set up in that tribulation time period. Okay, now the term tribulation, I'm using it because that's what people are familiar with. But the proper name for it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But the Bible clearly teaches that when the Antichrist shows up, there will be a mark of the beast. And if you take that mark, you will be damned. Period. Without another chance of getting out of it. Okay, so you're going to have to endure to the end. Is it that way right now in the church age? The age which we live in? No. Well, then what changes? What happens? That's the rapture. There's always a major event between dispensations. When you have a dispensational change going from Old Testament to New Testament, you have Jesus coming, dying on the cross. When you have the church age ending, it will be the rapture. Okay? When the tribulation age, the time of Jacob's trouble, when that ends, it will be Jesus Christ coming back down with his saints and whipping the Antichrist and the false prophet and the judgment of the nations. And then you'll have the millennial kingdom. There's always a major event that brings in another dispensation. And the next one in line is the catching away of the body of Christ, the blessed hope. We call it the rapture. Okay, I'm going to get more into that a little bit later too. But problem number four. Uh, it says in Matthew twenty four fourteen, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, they're preaching a different gospel in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, come on, Paul, why didn't you say anything about the kingdom? Because that's not the gospel that we preach today. We aren't to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation time period, they will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Why? Because the king is coming back. Jesus Christ, when he comes down to this earth, will rule and reign from Jerusalem. So the kingdom is coming. Okay, we're not to be preaching that gospel right now. Well, what is the gospel? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I think most of you are familiar with this. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Galatians 1, 8, and 9, a uh, very important warning here. Paul says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, here's the problem. If you want to say, I don't believe, I will not rightly divide the word of truth, I'm not a dispensational believer, you know, Matthew 24 is church age doctrine, okay? Then uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, gospel of the kingdom, and Paul didn't preach that gospel of the kingdom. And in fact, Paul said, anybody that preaches another gospel will be cursed. Let him be accursed. So, so how do you reconcile that? Was Jesus accursed or was Paul disobeying Jesus? No, you have two different dispensations. Right now in the church age, it's grace through faith plus nothing. Okay, in the coming tribulation time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, it will be faith plus works. You have to have faith in Jesus Christ, and you can't take the mark of the beast. It's just as simple as that, folks. Problem number five here, Matthew twenty four fifteen. This is another reason why you cannot teach, why a Christian cannot teach Matthew twenty four as being for Christians. Okay, it's for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew 24, 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, 
Whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, apparently the Steve Anderson guy does not understand. Because 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now how on earth can you have the Antichrist standing in you <laughs> as a Christian? You see, you can't reconcile this thing. You have to spiritualize it. Do the Roman Catholic thing. When you can't handle scripture, you just spiritualize it and say, well, the temple actually means, um, you know, and you just lie. No, the Bible is to be taken literally. The temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the Antichrist will allow the Jews to re um, get their system of, of animal sacrifices going again. And about halfway through the tribulation, he's going to cause that thing to cease and he's going to set himself up as God in that temple. And it says there, you know, when you see that, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. I'm talking about the rebuilt temple. Okay, you can't reconcile that with church age doctrine. Problem number six. This is another good one. Matthew chapter 24 verse 16. Then let, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Hmm, Judea? How many Gentile Christians are in Judea right now? See, it doesn't work. Problem number seven, Matthew twenty four twenty. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. What are Christians, Gentile Christians, doing keeping the Sabbath day? And they, you know, there's another big argument on that. Well, we're not supposed to worship on Sunday because Sunday is named after a pagan deity. You know, blah blah blah. Well, uh, if that's true that we are still to keep the Sabbath day, then how do you explain Romans thirteen verse nine? Paul gives the commandments that, that a Christian today is to follow. And he says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why didn't he say anything about keeping the Sabbath? Well, because in Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 13, it clearly says that the Sabbath day was given by God to the Jews as a sign. Okay? Romans chapter 11, verse 13, Paul says that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? Paul's writing to the Gentiles there in the book of Romans, and he never mentions the Sabbath day once. And I'd like anybody that, that disagrees with that, please send me a verse in the Pauline epistles. Paul is the one that writes to the Gentile believers. Please send me one verse in the Pauline epistles that says that we should keep the Sabbath day. Show me one. Okay. Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 uh, is the one that this Steve Anderson quoted. And that verse says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So then they tried to take that and apply it to the rapture, which it has nothing to do with. It has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, nobody knows the day of the rapture, obviously. But no one knows the day of the second coming either. Okay, and you say, but yes, you know, when the, when the tribulation starts, then you just count seven years to the day. No, because the Bible says that the days are going to be shortened, first of all. Secondly, there isn't any kind of a thing indicating that when the Antichrist shows up, that that's the beginning, necessarily, of the tribulation. Okay, you're not going to be able to time the day or the hour of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and you don't know the day or the hour of the rapture either. But these post-trib thieves will use that verse to say, well, see, you don't know the timing of the rapture. I mean, it's it's a ridiculous argument. Okay? Uh, but let me say something else quickly here, and that is that Paul explains the rapture for the first time in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. And that's why he calls it a mystery. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. Now that would not have been a mystery, what he was talking about there, if he was talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's not talking about the second coming in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the rapture. Okay, now we're going to go on to the next recording here. 
we have Steve Anderson again. And pay attention to what he says here. You're going to see how not only is he stealing verses that apply to the Jews, but he actually gets rid of the Jews. He tries to get rid of the Jews as well. Okay, this is called uh, replacement theology, or there's a bunch of other names for it. But it's a very, very wicked, very satanic um, form of belief, system of belief, that the Jews in Israel right now aren't really God's chosen people, and we should just kind of hate them because the church has taken over their place. The white Europeans are actually the Jews now, or something. Just a bunch of foolishness. But listen to what he says here. Okay, well, let's go back and read a little bit. It's going to hurt, but let's go back and read a little bit and see what day that is. Look at verse number 29. Matthew 24, 29, the Bible reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Who's the elect? Let me just pause it there for one second. Notice the uh, evangelistic put-on voice thing. And he shall send together his elect and gather the... Watch out for that, okay? Watch out for that, that stage acting voice, okay? That's how they deceive people, all right? Watch car commercials, watch uh, sporting events, anything. They will all modulate their voice to make it more exciting and more riveting. And uh, Look out for it, okay? But here we go. Let's finish what he's saying here. Who are the elect? God's chosen people, Christians, born again, say, oh, it's the Jews. No, the Bible says in Romans 11, the elect hath obtained it, Israel hath not obtained it. Okay, the elect is talking about, hey, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now you see what he did? Very, very crafty, very clever, what he did there. He lied about Romans chapter 11, and before the people could start to think, wait a second, where does it say that? He, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? He, he went charging off to prove a verse where God does call Christians the elect. Okay, but you're going to see this in, in as we continue on here. They'll say about the saints, well, there are saints in the tribulation, so that proves that Christians are there. No, God uses the term elect for Jews. He uses it for Christians. He uses saints for people in the Old Testament, he uses them for, you're a saint today in the body of Christ, and you'll be a saint, there will be saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, it's a, it's a term that God uses. But let's look at what he actually said there. He says, the Bible says in Romans 11, the elect hath obtained it, Israel hath not obtained it. <laughs> totally lied. Romans chapter 11, verse 7, it says, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Oh, well then, God's done with the Jew. No, he isn't. Not at all. And we're going to see more of that here in just a minute. But the point is, the nation of Israel as a whole rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah back then. But God's going to restore them in the future. And today, even though the nation of Israel has rejected Jesus Christ, individual Jews can still get saved. God has not, you know, cast away the Jewish people. Okay, but as a whole, they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And the election, the body of Christ are the ones that, you know, got saved. So, but let's, I'm going to read a couple verses here that this Steve Anderson wouldn't read to his congregation. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, before the verse that he tried to quote there and, and messed up, it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. 
For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. How can you spiritualize that? Paul makes it very clear that these are Jews and that he's a Jew and God hasn't cast his people away. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not that what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and they seek my life? But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There is still a remnant. And people talk about the Jewish conspiracy and Zionism and all this other stuff. And they point to all these, the Rothschilds, you know, and these big guys and everything. Well, of course the leadership's going to be corrupt. But what about the Jew on the street? The common man. You know, if you heard my message from Sunday, the common man is the, is the man that the Lord would go after most of the time. They were the ones that heard the Lord while he was here on the earth. They heard him gladly. What about the common Jewish man? I can tell you probably a lot of those would be willing and, and, and ready to hear about Jesus Christ. And those are the ones that the Lord's going to deal with, by the way. So don't fall for all this anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, Jewish hate stuff that's coming out from a lot of these quote-unquote ministries. Let's continue on here. Romans chapter 11, verse 11 through 14 says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. For if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh... And might save some of them. Was Paul talking to Gentiles? Yes. Did he, when he said, them which are my flesh, did he mean white Europeans that are now the spiritual Jews? No. He's not speaking spiritually. He's speaking physically. Them which are my flesh. He's talking about Jews. Uh, down in verse 25, Romans 11, 25 through 28. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Okay, when's that going to happen? It's going to happen at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. I think that there's still going to be some Gentiles getting saved during that time period. Okay, but verse 26 and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for their father's sakes. Okay? God's not done with the Jews yet. And it's not talking about spiritual Jews either. That... Anderson guy lied to you. He's a thief. He's stealing promises that God made to Israel. Okay, but now I, would, I want to show you something else here. Uh, Paul's attitude towards the Jews. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 5, he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Oh, that's spiritual Jews. That's the body of Christ, the church, right? <laughs> Wrong. It's according to the flesh. I'm a, I'm a brother of, of Paul spiritually, but not according to the flesh. You say, well, I don't know. Okay, read verse 4. Romans chapter 9, verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Jesus Christ was a Jew as well, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Okay, to spiritualize this thing is just wickedness. But like I said, he's a thief, 
and he will steal promises for, from the Jews and he'll deceive other Christians into believing that they are somehow spiritual Jews and all the promises God makes to Israel somehow fall on them now. It's just, it's wickedness. But Matthew 24, verse 30, which he read there, says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, uh, the tribes, all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Okay, um, who are the tribes? Well, if you know your Bible, the uh, 12 Jewish tribes show up again in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 8. Okay, so again, he's trying to steal these things. And I mean, it's just ridiculous. Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 and 35, by the way, let me read that quick. It says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Is Jerusalem the city of the great king right now? No, the great king is not in Jerusalem, but he will be in the millennial kingdom. So, you know, that's God's plan. God's plan is he's not going to come down here and restore America and, and everybody's going to, you know, come to America and, and Jesus will rule and reign from Washington, D.C. in the White House or something for a thousand years. That's nonsense. Jesus Christ isn't going to re, um, rebuild uh, England or something, you know, and, and rule from London, England. No, it's Jerusalem, okay? The Jews, they are the ones, Okay, now, thief number three. Let's move on here. Thief number three. Uh, something else that these guys will oftentimes do, because they can't handle the text of the King James Bible, they will try to correct it. And you're going to see that demonstrated here. And uh, this guy, well, let me just continue here. Here we go, thief number three. Argument number two. Jesus promised the church the following. Since you've kept my command and endure patiently, I was also keeping you from the hour of trial is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth, Revelation 3.10. Okay? Jesus said he'd keep Christians from this hour of trial coming on the earth, hence Christians will be delivered from the tribulation period. Answer to that argument is coming up right now. Now, the Greek word found in Revelation 3.10 translated keep you from this also is found in John 17.11, 17.15, and, it, and, it, and, and watch this in the Greek. Keep through keep you through. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just, I'm just telling you, okay? You decide for yourself, okay? This is what will happen if we are the generation of saints that to face the whole Antichristos, the Antichrist, uh, that I did a video on the other day, and I just said, I'll just put some attributes out there. You can agree or disagree, okay? That's what this is all about on these, uh, on these end time studies is, the end time studies is, you yeah, lay it out there, you agree or disagree. All right. <laughs> Wow, you got to hear from a Greek scholar there, apparently. Yeah, uh, this guy is on YouTube. I think his channel was actually removed because he's radically anti-government and uh, says a lot of very crazy things. Um, and he, he goes into speaking in tongues and all kinds of stuff. I mean, he's he's off his rocker, is what he is. I mean, he he's wacky, okay? But apparently, this guy, his, his first name's Billy. I don't know his last name. He doesn't give his last name, but he calls himself the End Time Watchman. And But apparently this guy, Billy, is smarter than the 54 translators of the King James Version. You know, he has to correct the King James Version with what he calls the Greek. And uh, interesting study you can do sometime. Again, I can't get into it here, but study the translators of the King James Version. 54 of these men. I'll just give you a couple, three of them here, a little bit about them. Dr. John Boyce could read and write Hebrew when he was five years old. <laughs> and, you know, he went on to, to translate many things. I'm just an incredible scholar. Dr. Lancelot Andrews could speak 15 languages and wrote his own private devotional books in Greek. Dr. William Bedwell was an expert in Arabic languages and translated a dictionary in Persian. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, this guy comes along, and he's more qualified to tell you what the Greek word should be translated as. Uh huh. And these men, 54 of these translators, and just amazing stories. I mean, these, these men were intellectual giants, 54 of them, 
And they took seven years to make the King James Version. I mean, it, and it's just ridiculous. But the average Christian today can come out and they buy their little Greek book, little uh, interlinear or something like this, and then they correct the King James Version. They think that they're somehow a scholar on par with these great men back then. And, oh, we, you know, this was obviously mistranslated. They don't know what they're talking about. And I just want to address this thing of this, this uh, phantom thing called the Greek. Just give you a couple quick facts about that. Uh, what about this Greek thing? Well, okay, let's look. There are two different types of texts there. There are the Receptus type text, uh, which you have on that line. You have Erasmus. He wrote a couple editions, had a couple editions of the Textus Receptus. Colonnaeus, Stephanus, Beza, and the Elzever brothers. All of them with multiple editions. Which one is the Greek? Okay, and let me just say quickly too here, a little English lesson. Whenever you put the in front of a singular word, you cannot be referring to more than one. In other words, the car, the house, can't mean more than one. Okay, if you want to make, say more than one, you have to say the cars, the houses. It's just as simple as that. But modern Christians, professing Christians, will use this term, the Greek, and have no idea what they're saying. They have no idea that there are many Greek texts. But that, I just gave you the Receptus line there, and there's quite a few on that side. But over on the Alexandrian side, the alternative critical text, you have Walton, Carolaeus, Fell, Mill, Toynard, Wells, Bentley, Mace, Bengal, Semler, Harwood, Mate, I guess is how you say that, Birch, Alder, Tischendorf, Griesbach, Hug, Schultz, Dodies, Lockman, Alfred, Tregellis, Wordsworth, Bagster, Westcott and Hort, Souter, Metzger, Aland, United Bible Societies, Aland, Metzger, and Nestles. Okay, <laughs> they're all editions of that Alexandrian Greek text. And there's multiple editions made by each one of those men. So which one is the Greek? You say, well, I, I think the Nestle's text is the most accurate. Okay, there are 27 editions of the Nestle's text. And the 27th edition, if you look at the introduction, it says this text is not to be considered as definitive. So what is the Greek text? But you have another problem there. How do you define these words? Oh, this word here should actually be better translated as, how do you define that? You see, there again, there are multiple Greek lexicons or dictionaries telling you the definition of the Greek words. And you have, you know, Trenches, Vincent, Thayer, the Thayer's uh, Greek lexicon. Thayer was a Unitarian. A Unitarian is somebody who does not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Strong's, Bullinger's, uh, Waste, Zodiades. Metzger, I mean, again, you have countless lexicons. Which one is the proper definition? See, don't rely, rely on this Greek thing. Don't run off to that and try to disprove the King James Bible. God's hand of approval is on the King James Version. Okay, it comes from the majority of Greek manuscripts line up with it. It has been around, you know, longer than any other English version. There were English versions that precede the King James Version, but they passed out of common use. The King James Version has led more people to the Lord, has made many more revivals, missionaries, churches. It's by their fruits that you know them. And the King James Version has produced more spiritual fruit than any Bible in history, including the original autographs. You didn't see the Christians in the first century doing the sorts of things and having such mighty deeds occurring as you do as you did since this uh, King James version has been printed but then again that's a whole other study now we're going to look at uh, thief number thief recording number 4 Steve Anderson again and uh, watch what he does here he combines a couple of scriptures see if you can pick out what he does here we go who, who believes that Jesus Christ is coming back someday? Amen, right? He's going to come in the clouds with power and great glory and the sound of a trumpet. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, come one another with these words. 
Did you catch it? You see, he couldn't deal with the text in First Corinthians chapter. I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter four. He couldn't deal with First Thessalonians four sixteen. I will read it for you. It says, "For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. First Corinthians fifteen fifty two. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Okay, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, why does the King James Version say trump? Well, Revelation 4, 1 and 2 says, And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. The word trump means the voice of the trumpet. Okay, and it says, Which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now that's so important right there, because that gives you the exact timing of the rapture being before the Antichrist is loose, loosed on the earth. It's the trump of God that John hears. Okay, God's not up there playing a trumpet. But see, that false prophet there, Steve Anderson, had to mix Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4.17. He blended them together because he couldn't handle the reading there, the trump of God. He had to say the trumpet being blown in Matthew 24 and tie that into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Again, very deceptive. But now, I'll show you another thing that they do. They will... Correct the, the text of the King James Version with what they call the Greek. And then they will change, they will pervert the words of the King James Version because they can't handle it. Or they'll combine two verses, take them out of context. And another thing that they do is they will search for another version. And most new versions, most of the Alexandrian, be they NIV, New King James, New American Standard, whatever, the Alexandrian Bibles, most of them will change the word trump to trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 1 Corinthians 15.52. They cover it up. And so you will have these false prophets. They will go and they will find other versions to change that change the text of the King James Version because they can't handle the text of the King James Version because the text of the King James Version proves a pre-tribulation rapture of the body of Christ. So I'm going to play the next one here. Thief recording number five. And again, we have this Billy, end time watchman. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Now, watch this. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet, with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are alive and remain, and are left. We're caught up together with him in the clouds, and meet the Lord in the air, so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another in these words. According to that passage, Paul didn't want the Christians to grieve like the rest of the unsaved mankind who had no hope. The encouraging truth stated here is that living Christians will be with their departed loved ones once again. Okay. Now, he read that, and I thought to myself, what on earth? Where is he getting that from? And so I have quite a few different new versions here, and I looked it up. He's reading out of an NIV from a man who professes to be King James only. <laughs> yeah, see, he's a deceiver. He's a liar. And he will read out of the King James Version and, and deceive people into thinking that he's a Bible believer. But when the King James Version crosses his peculiar doctrines, he'll run off to anything that he can find and use something like the NIV, which is clearly just a very, very wicked perversion of Scripture. I've spent quite a few years collating the NIV and everything, and I can document that. But now we're going to see another thing that they do, and I just thought I'd throw this in as part of the study. Listen to Billy again. So, so people have a free will to put out anything they want to as far as a pre-tribulation rapture. And by the way, the word rapture is not, does not even exist in the King James Bible. It does not even exist. So, you know, he's King James only, you know, King James Bible believer, but he'll quote the NIV, of course, you know. And they say, well, the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. Well, uh, neither do the exact words, the Great Tribulation. But they use that, and they say, well, you know, I believe in a post-tribulation rapture. They use the word. 
And, you know, to make that argument to disprove the rapture is really quite ridiculous. I mean, the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible either, but you can certainly see the Godhead, you know, the three and one, the one and three, and the one in the middle died for me, you know, they say, and all that. So, not an argument. But now let's go on to the next uh, lying thief who will try to steal your joy in the blessed hope. And this guy here, I'm going to make some more comments about him when it's done, but you got to watch out for this guy. I don't go off the Schofield Bible and their view of creationism. I don't go off their view of the rapture, which isn't in Revelations the way they say it is. Okay? You know, it says the beast will wage war on the saints and overcome them. How does he do that? They were all teleported up by Scotty. I mean, this is ridiculous. Folks, it, it's so sophisticated. Okay? Uh, it, it's, it's incredibly complex. Okay. Now, if you don't know who the voice was there, that was the voice of Alex Jones from Infowars.com. And I just want to give a strong word of warning about Alex Jones. Um... I agree with a lot of the stands that he takes, but spiritually, I wouldn't follow him an inch. Okay, uh, he professes to be a Christian, but the guy's got a, a mouth like a sailor. Sometimes, I mean, he just profanity, and you know, every time I hear his quote-unquote testimony, it's I was raised in a Baptist church, and my family is one of the oldest Baptist families in America. Uh, <laughs> Going to a Baptist church and, and having Baptist ancestors isn't going to save anybody. Okay, it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, he's a little friendly with some very wicked people in this world, too. So, the friend of the world is the enemy of God, the Bible says. So, I, I'd be careful about Alex Jones. But, uh, it's kind of interesting. He doesn't even know how to properly, you know, name the book that he just made a quote about there. He says, Revelations, uh, uh, it's revelation. It's not plural. It's singular. So, you know, I have an issue there. But then um, he says about this thing of saints. There are saints in the time of the Great Tribulation. So that proves that Christians, you know, how, how could there be saints in the Tribulation if they were all beamed up? And he says, by Scotty. You know, a little sarcasm there and everything. Why would he say that if he's saved? Doesn't he want to see Jesus Christ? Doesn't he want to go to be with Jesus Christ? No, I think his heaven's down here on this earth. But uh, the fact is, the word saint and saints appears 39 times in the Old Testament before Christianity ever even showed up. First time the word Christian shows up is in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. So the word saint is used for saved people in different dispensations. It doesn't apply only to Christians. And it just stands to reason that, okay, you have... The rapture. Just for a second, if you don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, just go along with it just for a second for the sake of this argument. You have the rapture. Don't you think anybody's going to be left behind that was just a professing Christian? Of course there would be people left behind. And they would realize, hey, I wasn't truly saved. I need to get saved. Here at Bible Believers Fellowship, we hand out some excellent little booklets about the rapture and explaining what to do if you miss it. Now, hopefully, I mean, we've handed thousands of these things out. Hopefully, some people kept them, threw them on a shelf or something, and they'll remember when the actual rapture does hit, they'll remember it, and hopefully they'll get saved at that point and be a tribulation saint. Okay, so it's not a valid argument to say there are saints mentioned in the tribulation time period, so that proves that, you know, Christians go through it. That's nonsense. And he says, of course, it's it's incredibly complex. Yeah, and, and it, you know, he obviously doesn't understand it <laughs> and doesn't know what he's talking about. But let's go on to the next thief recording here. Thief number eight, we go back to Billy, the end time watchman. Here we go. Well, we might not see the word church after the point of Revelation 4 1 in the book of Revelation. We still read often of the term saints, which comprises the ecclesia, the body, or the modern day translation church not the building a building is no more holier than that stump right there that you're looking at okay the building is not holy 
Well, of course, you know, but you see what he did? He took the word saints and he twisted it and tweaked it into ekklesia. Again, he goes to the Greek, the Greek, you know. He, he twisted it and made saints into the church to disprove the fact that the church is not mentioned in the book of Revelation in the time of Jacob's trouble. You see the lying that these people do? The word saint, I'm not, I don't know what it is in Greek, but it's not ecclesia. Okay, that's the word for church. See, it, just incredible how these people will lie. Now let's go on to uh, thief recording number nine. Again, we have Billy going back on the old saints thing here. He, the Antichrist, was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, tongue, language, and people, and nation. If anyone is going to captivity, he's going to captivity. If anyone to be killed with a sword, he will be killed with a sword. This calls for the faith and patience of the saints. Well, 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 well now, well, now. Okay, if the saints are up in heaven in pre-tribulation rapture, uh, how come it's calling them out here about uh, uh, faith for the saints and, and, and stuff like that to endure and over, be overcomers? Being an overcomer is not sitting there and clapping your hands to some song on Sunday, glory to God, and, 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 and saying, I'm going to fly away in the morning because it ain't going to happen. Now, God may require your soul today, tonight. He may require mine during, during this uh, video uh, exercise here, but I don't think so. Because you know what? I believe I've heard from God as far as it's calling on my life. And I want to tell you something. The Bible says this, no man knoweth the day nor the hour that God will return. So quit trying to say you do. Okay? You put a false, you put a false sense of security on people when you put this pre-tribulation uh, tradition out there and, and it makes people where they don't prepare and when they call us a bird and a snare, the Bible talks about. And guess what? And, and I say this is all sincerity and humbleness. Guess what's going to happen? When you don't fly away and you don't leave here and all hell's breaking loose, Every one of you preachers that have preached this, you're going to lose every ounce of your credibility on everything, not just that specific item. Do you get what I'm saying? Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> yes, let's move on. Uh, a number of lies there. First of all, he said, No man knows the day or the hour of the, of the coming of God. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does not say that. The Son of God. Okay? Just incredible. But, you know, he goes back to the saints' argument. They're saints, so that proves that Christians are in the tribulation. Nonsense. And you say, well, you're, you know, what if you're wrong, Brian? You'll lose all your credibility. I don't care about credibility. I'm not trying to please men. I'm trying to please God. I'm trying to live according to the Scriptures. I don't care about pleasing men. And I'm not going to be wrong, by the way. And, you know, if that guy's saved, and I say if, if he's saved, he's going up in the rapture. Like it or not. Okay, now, another recording here. Um, he lies again. Another good one here. This is Billy again. But watch this. It's true that saints will be delivered from the wrath of God, but it's not true that the tribulation is the wrath of God. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. There are no scriptures to back that up. Uh-huh. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. There are no scriptures to back up a teaching that the tribulation is not is, is God's wrath. Well, let's look at that. Revelation 14.10 The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be, be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Who's it talking about? Those who take the mark of the beast. Revelation 14.19 and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. What do you mean the tribulation isn't, isn't the wrath of God? Give me a break. Revelation 15, 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Revelation 15, 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, which liveth forever and ever. Revelation 16, 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 16, 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Huh. Revelation 19.15 
and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. How can you miss this many scriptures? Of course the tribulation is God's wrath being poured out. Jesus Christ is the one who starts it. He opens the first seal. Okay, Revelation chapter 6. He opens the first seal that unleashes the Antichrist. And of course you have the body of Christ, the redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation, up there before the first seal is opened. The body of Christ is in heaven. Okay, and it's God's wrath being poured out for seven years. Yes, it is. These people are such liars. It's just incredible. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because there's a whole movement that has been started. They call themselves pre-wrath rapture because they see the clear teachings of Scripture. God hath not appointed us to wrath. So they say, okay, well, I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but I believe in pre-wrath. I know of people like that. There's a whole system of teaching there. But to teach that there is no, God's wrath does not exist in the tribulation is ridiculous. And I, I saw another publication where some guy was actually saying that pre-tribulation rapture believers have lied about the events, you know, the, the seven uh, seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. They, this guy was saying that it's really not going to be that bad after all. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. It's going to be horrible. Okay, never before in history has it been as bad as it's going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's just going to be amazing. But now let's go on to thief recording number 11. And here we have a, a thing that a lot of these guys will do. Um, they will use a guilt by association argument. And we're back to Steve Anderson again. Here we go. And I'm a Baptist, and so I need the Bible's my authority. Not, uh, not, uh, Kirk Cameron is not yeah, my authority. Well, that's right. Tim LaHaye is not my yes, authority. Well, that's right. Kirk Cameron, Tim LaHaye, John Hagee is not my authority. Yeah. The Bible's my authority. That's what makes yeah. me a Baptist. No, that what, that's what makes you a, uh, illiterate, well, whatever. <laughs> See, you know, and again, the voice is up, and it's exciting, <sighs> you know. You, get, you just got to watch out for that. But he says there, you know, uh, uh, Kirk Cameron and Tim LaHaye and John Hagee, they're not my authority. Uh, well, they're not my authority either. The Bible is my authority. Okay? I don't know what Bible he's reading, but my Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture of the body of Christ. And I don't care what Tim LaHaye says or John Hagee or Kirk Cameron. You know, I know that all those guys have their problems. You know, uh, uh, Tim LaHaye, I have some very strong disagreements with him on his Left Behind series, and of course, I guess Kirk Cameron acts in those movies, so he's along with it. And of course, John Hagee is all about money. He's a cell evangelist. You know, and I have my disagreements with those guys. The fact that they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture does not disprove the pre-tribulation rapture. That's a ridiculous argument. But now let's listen to the next one. Thief number 12. And we're back to Billy again. I'm using him because he uses a lot of these arguments that I hear so many times. I got to tell you, there is no way, there is no way that, that I would ever believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? It ain't going to happen. It, it, it ain't going to happen, but that is, that, is a, that is a false sense of security that, that somehow or another you are, or this group of people are better than John the Baptist who had his head cut off because a little old whore was dancing in front of the, the king, King Herod, and, and he just chose the whore over the prophet of God and killed the prophet. Okay, next argument that they will oftentimes use is they will say, Christians have suffered in the past, so why would we think that Christians won't suffer for seven years? Okay, and um, certainly the Bible does teach that... Uh, Christians go through tribulation. John 16, verse 33. Uh, These things have I, I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Okay, Jesus Christ speaking. Acts 14, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God there being spiritual communion with God. 
Okay, Romans chapter 2, verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Okay, that's speaking of lost people. Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, in, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Okay, Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I'm not going to read the rest of these. I'll give you the scriptures here. You can look them up later. 2 Corinthians 1, 4, 2 Corinthians 7, 4, 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, Revelation 1, 9, Revelation 2, 9, Revelation 2, 10, Revelation 2, 22. All those places talk about Christians having tribulation. Now, let me state again. This coming seven-year period is the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the title that the Lord gives it. God never calls it the tribulation or the great tribulation. Okay, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days in Matthew 24, but God never says this time period is called the tribulation. So tying these scriptures together, the Christians have tribulation, so you're going to go through the tribulation. No, that doesn't work. Okay, and I'm not saying that we're going to get out of this earth before anything bad happens, you know, we won't get our fingernails dirty or something. It could get very bad. You know, they're trying to pass hate crime laws. They're, you know, all kinds of, of anti-Christian legislation and sentiment in America here and, of course, Canada and the UK and Australia. A lot of it going around. We might get persecuted before the rapture, before the time of Jacob's trouble shows up. But you can't use verses that teach that we have trouble and tribulation, trials and tribulation, to prove that we're going to go through God's wrath for seven years. It just doesn't work. Okay? Uh, and again, you have to understand, you have to look at the Bible as a whole. What is God's purpose? You know, I had, a, I had my nephew ask me the one time, are we going to go through the tribulation? I said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. What is the tribulation? What's the purpose of it? And he just kind of looked at me funny. You know, a lot of people have this mentality that the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, is kind of like a bad storm that's coming and God's kind of giving you the forecast for it. And you're going to have to go through it. No, it's God's plan to bring about this time of Jacob's trouble to give the Jews seven years of signs and wonders to confirm the New Testament. They're going to get to see the New Testament coming to pass on almost a daily basis. Okay, that's the purpose of it, to restore the nation of Israel. The time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled at the end of that seven-year period. The nation of Israel will be restored. Jerusalem will become the city of the great king, and Jesus Christ will rule and reign for 1,000 years. So simple. Okay. And by the way, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, will be coming down and the Jews are actually going to physically get to see him whipping the Antichrist and the false prophet and then the 200 million man army that's there. So Jesus Christ is going to get all the glory, which he so rightly deserves. I'm so sick and tired of hearing people cutting on the Lord and cutting on his word. I'm tired of it. I want to have... My Savior, my Lord, my God, I want to have him be glorified down here on this earth. Okay, and I don't know why, if you don't believe in a, you know, if you're post-millennial or amillennial, uh, you got some major problems. And I would say you better check and see if you're even saved. You know, why don't you want to have Jesus Christ? Why don't you want to see Jesus Christ inherit the throne in Jerusalem? Why do you want to, why are you so deceived into thinking that you can, you know, that man can somehow bring in a thousand years of peace or that the thousand years will never even happen? I mean, that's very, very wicked. Okay, thief number 13. Back to Billy again. And this is just more of the same nonsense about Christians going through persecution. Here we go. Okay, let's go with the arguments of a, of a pre tribulation rapture. Okay? Watch this. Argument number one. God is a loving God, and He would never allow His children to suffer through the Great Tribulation. Hence, they will be leaving through the rapture before any trouble occurs. Okay. All right. Now, answer. 
God has always been and always will be a loving God. In fact, in 1 John 4, 8, and, uh, 4 16, but we must not misuse the attributes of or misunderstand that He also is an infinite, eternal God whose ways and thoughts are not like ours. Okay? Let's move on. Right here. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways near ways. For declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Also, remember this, that God has allowed His most devoted servants to suffer incredible, incredible pain and death in this life. Even up to the point, just like I told you a while ago, John the Baptist, Stephen, James, Annabas, moreover, many of the prophets of God were killed, remember in the days of Jezebel, but most noteworthy is how the Father in heaven allowed His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer what He suffered. Have you ever thought about that? Let's move on. I don't want to bore y'all. I don't want to bore y'all. I do not want to bore you. I just want to put a few things out there and let's just move on with it. Again, you see it. You know, it's, it's what about the Jews? What about the nation of Israel? What about God's purposes for Israel? See, the thief steals the promises that God made to Israel and he steals your joy. Jesus isn't coming for you. He's not coming back. You're going to have to go through seven years of persecution and horrible distress and you might lose your salvation. They steal your joy and they steal, they destroy your crown, your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That's how the thief works. Let's listen to the next recording. Again, Billy. You understand? You think that you're going to be jerked out of here because you're so holy. I'll tell you what you do. You spend 10 minutes in a cotton picking mirror and look at yourself for 10 minutes and think about your life and everyday life and see how holy you are, just like I have to do. I'll tell you what I am. Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner saved by grace through faith. I strive to enter the narrow gate, but I still mess up. And I'm going to tell you something else, buddy. Let me run something else by you. If you think you're going to leave here before trouble and you're not going to face you're not going to face the wrath of what's coming, you're wrong. The wrath of God is revealed upon all sons of disobedience. Glory to God. You see what I'm saying? I know God has not appointed us to wrath but obtain mercy and salvation, but you listen to me real clear and let me say something to you. You you you, you literally, you literally you literally call yourself holier and higher than, than the apostles and the prophets, my God, when, when, when they gave their life for, for, for the Word of God to spread it. What you doing to spread it, I might ask? Well, I can pretty much guarantee more than you. Uh, but did you see the lie that he said? The wrath of God is revealed against all sons of disobedience. And then he said, glory to God. He just lied to you, and then he says, glory to God. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing how a false prophet will lie and then say, glory to God for that? Incredible. But let me show you the verses that he was trying to quote. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Are they saved people? No. They're lost. Verse 3, Among whom also we all had our conversation, conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul's clearly making a difference between saved and lost people. He's saying, Before you were saved... Back there in your past, you were a child of wrath. But you're not now. Okay, don't act like you're a child of wrath. Don't do their sins and things like that. But he clearly says, verse 2 there, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Clearly lost people. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Again, there's a clear difference here between the children of disobedience 
them, as Paul calls them, and Christians. You're not to act like you're a child of disobedience. Nowhere does it say son of disobedience. That's a lie. Colossians 3, verses 5 through 7. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which sake, or for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. When you were lost, you were a child of disobedience. But today you are not a son of disobedience. That term does not appear in the Bible. He lied to you, and then he said, glory to God. Okay, now we're going to go on to the last and, well, one of the last final speakers. And this guy is a just weirdo. <laughs> There's no nice way for me to put it. His, I don't know his full name. His name is Doug something or other, and, and he's on YouTube. And I was able to see some of his videos, and he's just, he's so far out, it's just ridiculous. But uh, his argument is that the church needs to be purified, and that's the purpose of the Great Tribulation. And this guy is warped. Here we go. I don't believe that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't think that you can justifiably make the case for it scripturally. But more than that, it goes against what I believe the, the spirals, the echoes in the Bible say. The what? The spirals, the echoes? What in the world is he talking about? Let's continue on. And common sense. It says that Jesus is going to return for a spotless, pure bride. That the church is going to be refined and purified. Basically, that she's going to be looking like Jesus. Well, uh, chapter and verse... <laughs> this thing that we have now this ain't it 39,000 denominations and a new one every other day arguing about stupid stuff um, again I got to cut in here 39,000 denominations uh, proof <laughs> none given if he's including anybody that's religious at all and I saw another one of his videos and he was talking about Catholics and Muslims and Jews and things acting like that they're all part of, you know, the under the umbrella of God's people or something. Now, the guy's a heretic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. There are not 39,000 denominations within the body of Christ, within true believers. That's nonsense. You know, and then he's saying, arguing over stupid stuff. I wonder what he would classify as stupid stuff. Probably things like the pre-tribulation rapture and the King James Bible and rock music and whatever else. But uh, let's continue on here. Excuse me. This ain't it. She cannot get raptured right now. If she did, maybe 1% of the people that say they're Christians are actually walking in holiness. Well, I agree with that. <laughs> you know, that's one thing I will agree. I don't think the majority of professing Christians, I mean, there's Catholics that call themselves Christians, and they'd kill a Bible believer, King James Bible believer, if they had the chance. I'm I back and forth all the time with Catholics on the Internet, and, you know... They hate my guts, but they call themselves Christians. So yeah, the majority of, of professing Christians are lost. But uh, I think this guy's one of them. This is not... You do not want the rapture to happen now. Okay. We're nowhere near refined and purified. We're nowhere near unity. We're opening a new denomination every other day. Okay. Now let me just show you a couple of things here from the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay, now, how is the bride made pure? According to that nut, he's saying that it's through God's wrath being poured out on that bride. <laughs> okay, well, let me show you what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Okay, it's the blood that cleanses us, that purifies us. Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 says, 
even as David also describeth the, describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You see, a lot of these New Agers and the Catholics and things, they have no idea what the word impute means. But the word impute... Let me get you a definition here quickly. Okay, definition of impute. Philemon, verse 18. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Okay, that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We have wronged God. We have sinned against God, and we owe him for that. But the problem is it's too great a debt. We can't pay it. The only way to pay a debt of payment for sin is to live a perfect life. And the only one who ever did that was Jesus Christ. And his blood that he shed on the cross is the payment for our sins. Okay, that's the only payment that there is. You are never going to be good enough to get to heaven on your own good works. And most people reject that because they're self-righteous. They think, well, I think if I try hard enough, if I, you know, work my way hard enough, God won't send me to hell. I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. Now, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to you. Your sins, your wickedness, if you accept Jesus Christ, then he will take on your sins and your wickedness. He paid for them on the cross and he will give you his perfect record in his life. That's how we can be presented as a pure, chaste virgin. It isn't by our suffering down here. Okay, that's Catholic doctrine. This idea of purgatory, of, you know, there are Catholics that go around and beat themselves and flagellate themselves. They call that, you know, whipping themselves and putting on hair shirts and, and uh, I think it's called St. Elmo's belt or something, little nails that jag into your skin. It's barbaric. It's heathen. Okay. Jesus Christ paid it all. Romans 4.23, down farther there in the chapter, it says, uh, verse 23 through 25, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom, to whom it also, sorry, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That's talking about Abraham there. Comparing him, you know, how he was justified by faith, we are justified by faith today. Okay? But Jesus died on the cross for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That's what imputation means. That's why we can be presented spotless at the rapture. There's no need for further purification. When the body of Christ is complete, when that last soul is saved, we are leaving to go be with Jesus Christ. Okay, and, and by the way, I want to say something else here about this great spiritual giant, this Doug false prophet guy, and that is he has long hair. In the videos, he's got long hair. And you say, oh, what's the big deal? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15 says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering and it's interesting revelation 9 verses 7 through 8 says that, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men look at verse 8 and they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions hmm and somebody says well yes but jesus had long hair well, again, we go back to the Jew thing, back to the Old Testament in the book of Matthew there. Leviticus 19, verse 27 says, Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Okay, Jesus, Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he was a Jew under the law. Okay, and there was a transition period. The law and the prophets are until John, and then the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is preached. The Jews rejected the kingdom when their king was there on the earth. Therefore, they crucified their king. They had said, so we have no king but Caesar. 
Really stupid mistake. You don't want Rome ruling over you. They rejected their king, and so the kingdom was put off until the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, that's what happened there. Jesus was a Jew under the law, so yes, I believe that he had long hair. But you're not a Jew under the law today. We're not under the law today. And going and trying to pretend that you are and walking around and trying to act Jewish and trying to use Hebrew words for for words in your New Testament that were given in Greek and now we have them in English, you have no business doing that. Okay, Witness to people in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't go around saying Yeshua and all this stuff, pretending that you're a Jew when you're not. Okay, That's another uh, thing you need to watch out for. Uh, you're not a Jew, uh, most of you that are saved. And if you are a Jew, then you should be talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, thief number 16. We'll go back to listen, listening to more of this Doug guy. And, and, you know, as we're listening to this, listen to his attitude about the body of Christ. And ask yourself whether this guy's really saved. Here we go. I don't believe judgment is coming on the world because of homosexuality or because of the number of abortions or, or because of Hollywood or Democrats or whatever. I believe judgment is coming on the world because of the lukewarm church. And we are going to be spewed out and everybody else is just along for the ride. <laughs> Speak for yourself, buddy. <laughs> um, I'm not lukewarm. Okay, I'm more of a Philadelphian Christian than I am Laodicean. I used to be a Laodicean, definitely, but not anymore. You know, am I perfect? Well, of course not. I'm not without sin, but I'm not a Laodicean. Okay, I take some very strong stands on issues, and it's cost me a lot of friendship and a lot of popularity and whatever else. Okay, and I know a lot of my friends that write to me and everything, you're going through the same thing. You're not Laodicean, you know, and... uh so again, who's this guy speaking about? And judgment's not going to come on the world because of homosexuality or abortion or Hollywood? Weird. Weird why there's this hatred of the body of Christ. This desire to see violence and evil come on the body of Christ. But not on the sodomites and abortion and wicked fornicators out in Hollywood. Just weird. Let's listen to another one. You don't get raptured when you deserve judgment. You get judgment. Why? So that you will be refined. So that all that is chaff will burn off. So that the wheat and the tares will be separated. Um, <clears throat> what about the judgment seat of Christ? <laughs> okay, uh, where your works are tried by fire. You're not tried by fire. Your works are. This guy's ignorance of Scripture is pretty bad. Let's know another one here. We're just about done. The reality in my mind is Jesus comes back for a spotless bride at the end of the tribulation, right before the last battle, and we meet him in the air. He doesn't come. That's not the third coming. That's the second coming. And the only way to have a pure spotless bride, for us to be in unity, for us to be loving each other, is for the kind of afflictions like the world has never known before. Because we are so stubborn. We are such stupid sheep. We are so intent on going our own way, on our own comforts, on our own pleasures, that nothing short of complete, imminent, total, daily disaster is going to force us onto our knees, praying, trusting the Lord, and being one. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, again, um, it's not for the purification of the church. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Um. And this thing of, well, I believe in my mind, yeah, that's the only place it is, and it just came out of his mind, uh, but uh, <clears throat> in my mind, I believe that the church is going to go up at the end of the tribulation to meet the Lord in the air. And that's not the second coming, it's, or it's not the third coming, it's the second coming. Another little deceptive thing that they do, they claim that uh, the rapture would be, in, would be the coming of Jesus, so then the, the second coming at the end of the tribulation would actually have to be the third coming, so that proves doesn't prove anything. Jesus Christ comes back. It's a mystery. Every eye is not going to see him at the rapture. He doesn't come and, oh, you know, here he is. No, Christians get called out. Okay, it's a mysterious thing. The world's going to be quite confused about it, especially because there's going to be a lot of professing Christians left behind 
and uh, <clears throat> I won't mention any names. You can kind of figure that one out. But, okay, we go and we go up. We zoom up to the clouds at the end of the tribulation as Jesus is coming. And then we turn right around and do an about face, about face, forward, march. And we come right back down. Uh, what about the judgment seat of Christ? What about the marriage supper of the Lamb? Mentioned in Revelation 19. When does that take place? You see, kooky. Okay, let's listen to another one. Why, why would God afflict the planet with this? To get the church on its knees. To get us to be one. To get us to drop all of our divisions and be one. Okay. We're supposed to be one. You know, let's all be one. It's kind of interesting because the false prophet, when he comes, uh, causes all religions to come together. You know, you'll have one world government under the Antichrist and one world religion under the false prophet. And, you know, you see the, oh, what are they called? The, the Pope things, um, the World Council of Churches and, and all these big ecumenical get-togethers. I can't think of the name right now. But, you know, they, all, they say, we all worship the same God. Let's all be one. Um, yeah. What does the Bible teach, though, about Christian, quote-unquote, unity? Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Are we to be one with people that teach false doctrine? No. We're to get away from them. Avoid them. And, you know, I, I have friends and things that write to me on, on email and, and YouTube and a bunch of other places where I'm at. And they say, you know, some of them have a good church that they can be part of and they stay there. Good. Praise the Lord. Then there are other people that can't find a good church in their area. And they're saying, what am I supposed to do? Start a house church. Well, shouldn't we just compromise and go to some big modern church somewhere? No. Get away from them. If they do not preach and teach from a King James Bible, and if they are messed up doctrinally as a Christian, you have a responsibility to get away from them. 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And look at this, verse 5. From such turn away. Get away from them. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise... And consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Kind of like saying, the Greek, you know, should be translated, right? Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Get away from them. Oh, but we should all be one. No, we shouldn't. Hey, we can be one if we stand by the doctrines of the Bible. You know, here at Bible Believers Fellowship, we have a doctrine which we believe very firmly. It's called in one accord, being in one accord. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be a cult type of thing and we all have to dress the same and look the same and everything. No. We can have differences of opinion on minor issues. But on major doctrines of the Bible, we have to be in agreement. And if you're not in agreement with our major doctrinal stands, then we ask you to fellowship elsewhere. I mean, what's the purpose of you coming if you don't agree with us and if you aren't willing to change? You know, go somewhere else. Simple as that. God does not want unity based on lies and falsehood. God wants unity based on truth. And when you hear this talk about we should all be one and we should all get along and we should put aside our differences, usually it's by people who don't care anything at all about doctrine. And if you remember earlier, this Doug guy said about Christians arguing over, quote, stupid stuff. That's what he said. And I guarantee you it's about doctrine that he calls stupid stuff. So 
Let's listen to a couple more here and then we're done. Don't bet on escaping the bad stuff. We earned the bad stuff. And it's a judgment on our head. And we don't get to get out of it. We brought it on ourselves. Again, why is there such hatred for the body of Christ? See? And I don't believe he's, you know, he's a, we brought this on ourselves. Now, I don't think he's saved. I think he's a, a false prophet. But uh, it's the time of Jacob's trouble for the last time. Okay? God's purpose is to restore Israel. Jerusalem will become the city of the great king. Now I'm going to finish with two more clips of Billy, the radical hillbilly, <laughs> uh, end time watchman. And of course I'm not cutting on him because he's from the south or, you know, because he's country. I'm country. I'm from the north, but you know, I'm a country boy. I'm not cutting on him because of that. Okay. But, uh, the guy just doesn't know scripture and he's makes a lot of big statements and a lot of, you know, things that he just can't back up with the Bible. So let's finish off with two more uh, recordings from him, and then we'll close. And based on Scripture, it ain't going to happen. There ain't going to be no pre-tribulation rapture based on Scripture. Like I said, draw your own conclusions. I'm just leaving it out there. This is just a short video that I wanted to bring out and expand uh, scriptures and, and let you know and understand that, that no way, shape, or form or fashion do I believe in any such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture based on the Word of God. Okay, well that's where we're going to close it there. And you're going to, as I stated, these people that teach a post-tribulation rapture and they know the arguments and things and they persist in their error, they are thieves. And if you want to go along with that line of thinking, then you're going to have to steal verses that apply to the Jews, and you're going to have to have zero joy, because you're not looking for Jesus Christ, you're looking for the Antichrist. You're looking to have to survive and, and claw your way, and, and oh, it's going to be so terrible with the water turning to blood and with everything else. Oh, it's going to be horrible. Yeah, you're not going to have any joy in life. You know, my joy comes from knowing that I could see Jesus Christ later today. I'm looking forward to it. And in a couple minutes here, I'm going to close with a with a, some music to end this study. But third, they will destroy. If you want to follow this post-tribulation rapture nonsense, uh, or no rapture nonsense, they're going to destroy your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, you're not going to be busy about the Lord's work. You're going to be busy trying to stockpile to survive the seven years without taking the mark of the beast. That's what's going to happen. And you're also not going to love the appearing of Jesus Christ because you're not expecting him for at least seven years. So you're going to lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ because you believed in a bunch of lying thieves. Okay? Strong rebu rebuke, yes, but um, I just felt the Lord wanted me to put this message together uh, just as a real good kick against false prophets that are deceiving members of the body of Christ into not looking for Jesus Christ. So, that's it for now. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, please pray for this ministry. Um, just pray that the Lord continues to keep me safe and, and all the people here at Bible Believers Fellowship and uh, that He gives us wisdom uh, for the times that we have left. And... Um, Please feel free to write to us if with any questions or, or anything. And, and I, I love to hear uh, testimonies of people going out and getting things done for the Lord. I just got an email today, uh, one of my brethren in Christ. Um, I have a video on tracks, putting out tracks and things and, and the urgency of it. And he said about him and his wife went out this weekend and were passing out tracks. And a man came up to him and he smiled and he said, I really appreciate what you're doing. God bless you. And he said, I want to give you something. And he gave him $120 to put towards more tracks. And he said, you spend that on tracks and you keep doing what you're doing. That's what I want to hear. You know, that's fruit. I like that. I don't want checks coming in or something like that. No, I want to hear spiritual fruit coming from this ministry. That That's just a joy to my heart. And, I, and my prayer is for all of you that have listened to this and that do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, get busy for the Lord. 
because honestly, I don't think there's much time left. So thank you for listening. I'm going to close with this song. Enjoy. Okay, the name of this message is going to be Post-Tribulation Rapture Thieves Part 2. Uh, this will be the second part to the original message that I did, Post-Tribulation Rapture Thieves. And uh, the reason I did the original message and the reason I'm doing this today is to expose the lies and the, the false teachings of these false prophets that are out there today trying to destroy people's faith in the pre-tribulation rapture, the Bible doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. And some people get offended at, at the fact that I call these people thieves. But let me explain to you why I call them thieves. Okay, This was in the original study, and, and you ought to listen to that one first before you listen to this message. But I'm just going to kind of recap here. I'm going to go over uh, why I call them thieves. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. 
I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now the three things there, they come, the thief comes to steal. Number two, they come to kill. And number three, they come to destroy. So you see those three things there. Now, those who teach a post-tribulation rapture will do three things. Okay, number one, they will steal God's promises to Israel. And you're going to see in this study especially this whole movement of these people who are saying that they're Jews and they're not. We're going to get into that later. Number two, they will kill a Christian's joy in the blessed hope. That's what the Bible calls the rapture. Uh, okay, the word rapture does not appear in the Bible, and people try to use that to prove that it's not true. Well, that's stupid, okay? The word trinity doesn't appear in the Bible either, but you can plainly see the Godhead. That does appear, and it's three in one. Okay, I'm not against the word trinity. People try to make a big issue of that. And I'm not against the word rapture, okay? And number three, the thief comes and destroys your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You are to love the appearing of Jesus. You are to be looking for the appearing of Jesus, not the appearing of the Antichrist. And they get offended at that. Oh, we're not looking for the Antichrist. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are trying to prove that the next thing to happen is the Antichrist to come. Okay? They, they take away the blessed hope of Jesus Christ catching the body of Christ out first. Now, I have a lot of studies on this. Um, you need to listen to everything. Don't waste my time contacting me, telling me I'm wrong because you've only listened to one message. Okay, I have three, a three-part study on the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, this is a issue I've studied for a very long time. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. If you want to know about the rewards of the judgment seat of Christ, it says here, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Okay, it isn't about, oh, I'm so scared of the tribulation and I want to get out of here because I'm a coward and I'm not ready to suffer and I don't want to suffer for Jesus. That isn't it. It's, I want to go see Jesus Christ. I want to go and be with all the other Blood-bought saints. Okay, I have I have contact with people all over the world, brothers and sisters in other countries, brothers and sisters in other states here in America. I want to be with them. But I can't right now. I can't go and travel and be with every single one of my friends out there in the world. But when the rapture comes, when the blessed hope comes, we're all going to be caught up together and be with Jesus Christ in the clouds. I want that day to come soon. It's not about escaping suffering. It's about, I want to go be with Jesus. That's what it's about. Loving His appearing. Okay? Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Listen to verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. See, the thief comes and they destroy your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because you're not looking for Jesus Christ anymore. I mean, if Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation, well, then you have at least seven years. You are looking for the Antichrist because when you see the Antichrist and you say, okay, there's the Antichrist. Now I have seven years before Jesus Christ comes back. You'll know the timing. Or the, the specific timing. Okay, the time is shortened. In the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven year uh, period that people call the Great Tribulation, that's not actually correct. We're going to get into that too. But you can look and you can kind of guesstimate when the Lord's going to be coming at the second coming. When you see the Antichrist, then you can say, okay, I got seven years. That's not what the Bible teaches for the body of Christ. Okay? In the Pauline epistles, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, it's a mystery. It's an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Again, listen to the other studies. I can't get into that here. We have a lot of material to cover today. Okay, but I want you to remember, all post-trib rapture thieves 
will do one or all of these three things to overthrow the pre-tribulation rapture. Number one, they almost always, without a doubt, will quote Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, or Luke 21, which all pertain to the second coming. And they will all quote that as proof that Christians go through the what they call the Great Tribulation, okay, which is false. Number two, they will all quote, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of times they will quote other versions of Scripture, perversions, Alexandrian Roman Catholic Bibles. They will quote those to overthrow the King James Version because the King James Version teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, <clears throat> Number three, if they don't use a new version, a lot of times they'll go to what they call the Greek. Okay, They'll try to twist the text because they can't handle the text of the King James Bible. Okay, so they'll do one of those three things, and you're going to see that as we go through this study. Now, if you listen to the first message, the first post-trib rapture thieves message, I ended the study with a guy named Doug. I don't know what his last name is. He's on YouTube. All of these videos come from YouTube. I cut the video out, so you just hear the audio. Okay, obviously I can't do video uh, here on sermon audio. Um, well, at least through a sermon, the, the format of a sermon. But... I'm going to play the very last guy there was Doug. He's going to be the first one again. I wasn't going to start out with this guy, but I found another one, and I, I wanted to include it. Uh, this guy's really kind of kooky. Okay, so let's start out here. Uh, the, the recording quality is not real good. There's a lot of background noise, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to make it out here. So let's get started. Here's Doug, thief number one. And, and I, I didn't really have any understanding of how bad it really was tell you the truth until the Lord said all all of you went your own way <clears throat> the heartbeat of the bride stopped I'm like Lord how, how and he showed me see remember when you did that remember when you chased that okay let me just stop there for just a minute the Lord showed me. Oh, the Lord told me. He showed... Chapter and verse. The number one thing that you need to do to avoid being deceived by false prophets is you need to know your King James Bible. <clears throat> they will all go to this... Oh, God told me. In a dream, in a vision, in a, in a... He spoke to me. Where's that in Scripture? See? God's not going to tell somebody something that's contrary to His Word. Okay, the word that God has spoken to us, Jesus said about the word that I've spoken unto you, the same shall judge you in the last day. God gave us his word in English, the King James Bible. And when somebody starts saying, oh, God showed me this or God showed me that, you better be careful. But he said there, he said, the heartbeat of the bride stopped. Now, you are the bride of Christ if you are saved. And so I take issue with the fact that the guy says that <clears throat> I'm basically dead. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I'm born again, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm on my way to heaven. Okay? And for this nut to say, oh, the heartbeat of the bride has stopped. Oh, the Lord told me. He's a liar. Let me read to you some scripture here, which is what you need to do. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, if you mess around with sin as a saved person, you're going to lose your sanctification, you'll lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, but you will not lose your salvation. Okay, that is heresy, that's ridiculous. When you are saved, you are part of the body of Christ. Okay, you are his bride. <clears throat> we'll get into that a little bit more later. Verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Jesus paid the price for your sins on Calvary. Okay? That's the way it is. I'm real sorry. You know, oh, the bride's dead. No, it isn't. No, no, no. No. Your old man dies when you accept Jesus Christ. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let me continue here. Verse 9, Romans 6, verse 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. 
This guy, oh, the bride's dead. The bride's dead. Uh, Jesus died once on the cross. Okay? And when you accept him, you die. Your old man dies there on the cross with Jesus. He paid the price for your sins. And now you are alive with Jesus Christ. Verse 10, Romans 6.10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, your old man died at Calvary, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are alive through Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Your old man died at Calvary. Don't go back and live like the old man. That's what it's saying here. Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Your old man of sin was destroyed at the cross. You are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about that your righteousness is imputed to you. Okay? That means Jesus paid it all. He paid the price for your sins. And you say, oh, good, then that means I can live in sin now. No, you can't. Okay, you will lose a lot of things if you live in sin. You will lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You will lose your health. You will lose your testimony. You will lose your joy. But you cannot lose your salvation. Why? Because your old man was destroyed back there on the cross. And now you are alive in Christ Jesus. The bride cannot die, okay? The bride... The heartbeat of the bride is not going to be stopped. That is ridiculous. It's heresy. Okay, but let's continue here. Back to Doug. About two years ago, when the Lord showed me the red dragon, uh -huh. the Lord said, there's nobody. There is nobody left. Me included. Okay. Uh... <laughs> About two years ago, the Lord showed me the red dragon. Oh, really? Well, let's uh, look in Scripture and see who the red dragon is. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. You jump down to verse 9 there in Revelation chapter 12. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this Doug guy says, well, the Lord showed me the red dragon. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Lord showed you Satan? Yeah. A uh, little problem there. And then he said, the Lord said there is nobody left, me included. Uh, I'm left. I'm serving the Lord, and I know a lot of other people are. Why is this guy lying like that? There's nobody left. Yes, there is. This guy's a liar. Okay? And, you know, he's getting visions of Satan. I mean, weirdo. Just a total weirdo. Okay? And, and you know, where is this stuff at in Scripture? That there's nobody left. There are no Christians left before the rapture. Uh, yeah, okay. I know as a fact that there are a lot of Christians left. Uh, and we're going to be leaving soon, contrary to what this nut tries to teach people. Okay, let's continue here. The Lord said it had to happen. It had to go this way. Chapter and verse. She had to die. The bride had to die. Chapter and verse. The spiritual body of Christ had to follow the same path as the physical body of Christ. Chapter and verse. Prophetically, Jesus walked this out ahead of us. And we talk about the church being the body of Christ. Well, his physical body was whipped and beaten and shredded and torn and mocked and bled through the streets and crowned a thorn and sign over the top, behold the king of the Jews. And it and, and died, sliced up into little pieces. Chapter and, and verse. died, went into a tomb for three days, and then the, the tomb bursts open 
and big flash of bright white light and out comes chapter and verse Jesus in a new body in a, in a restored glorified body ready to go to heaven washed clean without wrinkle or spot uh yeah <laughs> Okay, uh, out comes Jesus in a new body, in a restored, glorified body, ready to go to heaven, washed clean, without wrinkle or spot. No scripture. Okay, no scripture given. John chapter 20, verse 16. He says, remember he said, Jesus came out in a new body, ready to go to heaven. Glorified body, ready to go to heaven. John chapter 20, verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Jesus Christ, when he came out of the grave, was not in his glorified, perfected body yet. Okay? He had to take, he had to go up to heaven and probably, you know, I think, present himself as the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, and he couldn't be touched by any sinner down here. <clears throat> and he presented himself as the perfect sacrifice, and that's where salvation begins, okay? And he comes back down, and then he's telling his disciples, touch me. You know, Thomas comes in, I don't believe it's Jesus and stuff, and he says, touch me and see, handle me and see. It's me, you know? So, this guy, again, he teaches heresy. He teaches just, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then he says uh, that Jesus was washed clean, okay? Uh, how was he washed clean? How was Jesus washed clean? Did he need to wash himself in his own blood? Uh, again, he he says this stuff. Oh, the Lord told me these things, and then and it's contrary to Scripture. I think in reality, it's the red dragon that's telling this guy th these things. Okay, Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty-five. Let's read here. It says, "Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it." that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You are made clean, you are sanctified by the word of God, the King James Bible. Don't mess with the others, they won't sanctify it. Verse 27, Ephesians 5.27 says, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Okay, you are washed clean in, in terms of your sins, in terms of terms of eternal judgment. You are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the purchase price for you. That's how you get saved. But then after that, your sanctification, being set apart from the world, happens mainly through your understanding and study and reading of Scripture, of the Word of God. Okay, and that word of God is the King James Bible. All right, that's how it happens. Ephesians 5.28 So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherish, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. If this guy is teaching that, that oh, the, the bride's dead, well, then Christ is dead as well. We're members of his body, okay? You say, well, wait a second, I thought you said the bride of Christ and, and yet we're part of the body of Christ. That doesn't make any sense. How can we be two different bodies? Well, let's continue reading here. Ephesians 5.31 For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The body of Christ and the bride of Christ are one and the same. So when this nut comes out and says that the bride is dead, the heartbeat stopped, he's saying Jesus Christ is dead. Okay? He's a heretic. That's what you get from a false prophet. Okay, but let's continue here. Well, if we're the body of Christ, why should we expect that it will be any different for us? Why should we expect some different path than the physical body of Christ had to go through? <clears throat> why should we expect it? Because we're not perfect. We're not sinless. Jesus Christ was. If you lived 
your life and ended up dying on the cross, you know where you'd go? You'd go to hell. Okay? And your blood that's shed wouldn't be enough to save you or anybody else. Okay? This, this thing that we have to suffer. You're going to see a little bit later where that's coming from. You're going to see a little bit later who teaches that. Okay, but that is one of the big elements that you'll see in the coming out of the mouths of the post-tribulation rapture thieves. They will all talk about suffering and the need to suffer. And oh, if you don't suffer, you know, then then how can you expect to be right with God if you yourself don't suffer? Yeah, see, they try to add things to salvation. Jesus didn't pay it all on the cross. No, we have to help him along. Okay, that's heresy. All right, that's that is doctrines of devils, as the Bible calls it. Jesus paid a debt which we ourselves could not pay. But let's continue, and li and listen to what he says about the bride of Christ here. It says Jesus is not going to return, except for a, a bride who is pure and spotless, dressed in white, without wrinkle. Well, this ugly thing. This sexually transmitted disease, aid infested, greedy, fat, disgusting harlot of a bride that we got now can't possibly be what he's returning for. Now, you want to tell me that that man's saved? To talk that way about the bride of Christ? He's lost. He's on his way to hell. He is a false prophet. And by the way, if you study what this guy's actually saying, he he goes on to say about that the the bride of Christ is is the body of Christ is now thirty nine thousand denominations a new one every day and everything. Listen to the last study. He equates anybody, any religious system in the whole world that's part of the bride of Christ, part of the body of Christ. Okay, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, there are very few real Christians on this earth. Okay, the vast majority of professing Christianity, be they Catholic or Episcopalian, or Lutheran, or Anglican, or a lot of Baptist, or Methodist, or Presbyterian. You get down through the denominations, there are a lot of people that are just doing what their religion tells them to do, and they have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, true, born-again, Bible-believing Christians are very rare. Okay, we're a very small number. All right, so the guy doesn't know what he's talking about, and but the hatred that he has for the bride of Christ, calling the bride of Christ an ugly thing, sexually transmitted disease, aid-infested, greedy, fat, disgusting harlot of a bride, uh, he's lost, okay? This is what you call a false prophet on their way to hell and trying to deceive people, not into you're saved by grace through faith, not of works, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 which we'll be talking about later. He doesn't want that. No, it's got to be, you have to suffer. You have to be a co-redemptrix, you know, like Mary. You know, you have to suffer along with Jesus to be saved, uh, which is heresy. But now, now let's go on to the next thief. This is thief number two. And uh, I don't know the name of this person on YouTube. It's a woman. And she has, her name is Victoria for YHWH. Yahweh. Okay, Yahweh is not a Bible term. Okay, that is a false name for God, the God of the Old Testament. Okay, the God of the Bible, really. Um, but she is reading a message from Corey Ten Boom. Now, Corey Ten Boom went through the Nazi camps and stuff like that, and I'm sure she was a very good woman, very godly woman. But uh, I don't know if this is being taken out of context or whatever. But if, if this is what Corey Ten Boom actually wrote and actually believed, then she was wrong on this point. Whatever other good things she did, she was off on the rapture. Okay, And you're going to hear uh, that she's just coming out and attacking the Bible doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. And she gets messed up. And we're, I'll show it to you. I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. So here we go. Thief number two. There are some among us teaching there will be no tribulation, that the Christians will be able to escape all this. These are the false teachers that Jesus was warning us to expect uh -huh. in the latter days. Most of them have little knowledge of what is already going on across the world. I have been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. 
in China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you will be translated, raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say, sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for the persecution rather than telling them Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution. Let me just pause it for just a second. I don't want to cut in here. I don't want to obscure the recording. But notice, first of all, you got background music there to evoke emotions. Um, but secondly, they always confuse this thing of persecution and tribulation with the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, which is the real name for it. Nowhere in the Bible, in the King James Bible, is it called the Great Tribulation. Okay, now people use the term. I'll use it so people know what I'm talking about. But the point is, people say, well, see, it says in the Bible that you'll have tribulation, and so therefore you're going to go through the tribulation. That's not what the Bible teaches. You will have persecution in this life. But to, t to take that and say that these people are somehow, you know, we're going to go through the tribulation and, and there's not going to be a rapture and all this, that is ridiculous. Okay, let me continue here. How to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. I feel I have a divine mandate to go and tell the people of this world that it is strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in training for the tribulation, but more than 60% uh -huh. of the body of Christ across the world has already entered into the tribulation. Right. There is no way to escape it. We are next. Okay, let me stop it there for a minute. More than 60% of the body of Christ across the world has already entered into the tribulation. There is no way to escape it. We are next. Oh, really? 60% of the of body of Christ is now in the tribulation? Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, question, where is the Antichrist? Uh, who is he? Can you point to him? Uh, where's the mark of the beast? I don't recall having to take the mark of the beast yet and worship the worship the beast. Where's that at? You know, oh well, they're doing it in China and and you know other places. No, they're not. That's a lie. They're not taking the mark of the beast over there. They're not worshiping the beast. It's a worldwide system. Okay, the new world order, as it's called by the Luciferians, that they're going to set up and have the Antichrist run it. Where's it at? Oh, don't tell me it's in China, but it hasn't come here yet. That's nonsense. Okay, absolute total nonsense. That 60% of the body of Christ is not currently in the tribulation. And by the way, Christians have been persecuted for centuries. Does that mean that they were in the tribulation? Does that mean that the, the martyrs of the first century, the first century Christians, does that mean that they were in the tribulation almost 2,000 years ago? See the, You see the problem? That these people create when they try to make persecution into the great tribulation it, it's just it's ridiculous we are not in the time of Jacob's trouble that time has not come yet okay now we're gonna go to thief number three we have a I don't again I don't know the guy's name he's some radical Catholic and uh, he's got some show and I, I saw the one video and uh, so let's listen to this one of the most popular notions flying around today in popular culture is this notion of the rapture. And there is probably nothing, and listen very closely to this because this is the truth, there is nothing more anti-biblical than the notion of the rapture. Oh yeah, I'll take that from a Catholic. You know, the Catholics sure do know their Bible. They're Bible scholars. Uh, to say that the rapture is anti-biblical is just shows a high degree of stupidity. Okay, please, you know, you say, well, what about all these questions I have? Well, listen to the three-part message on the pre-tribulation rapture, and you'll hear all the proof that the Bible does teach a pre-tribulation rapture. Rapture. Uh, but as we continue here, you're going to see why the Roman Catholic Church hates the idea of the rapture uh, being pre-tribulation. So let's continue. This notion of the rapture is false because it, it almost relieves your fears. It, yeah. it, it says that you're going to get to escape. There'll be no suffering and no trial or tribulation for you oh, Christians, boy. good Christians. And it, that's just preposterous. 
that's preposterous. Jesus Christ died on the cross and was crucified and then beaten and, and you know, all the suffering that he went through. And you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, and yet somehow you get to escape the suffering and the pain? It, Jesus said exactly the opposite. This is why this is anti-biblical. It's not unbiblical. It's anti-biblical. <laughs> okay, we see again the, you have to suffer. You have to be co-redeemer. You know, you got you have to suffer. And if you look at some radical, you know, Catholic things, I mean, go on YouTube or on the internet and look up extreme Catholicism. And you'll see over in the Philippines how these people walk down the streets, these young men, and they will take a chain with blades on it and they will beat themselves over their backs until the blood is just, their, their backs are just ripped open and the blood's literally flowing down their back and down the back of their pants. And it's staining their clothes. And then they, they lay there on the ground and people whip them and beat them and stuff. It's disgusting. I saw some the other day and I could barely even watch it. It was just, it was just so horrible that these people are so demented and, and pagan that they think that that somehow can merit salvation or, or less time in purgatory or something. It's just ridiculous. Jesus paid the price on Calvary. You know, people can't get that through their thick heads because they're self-righteous. They don't want to say, I can do nothing at all to merit salvation. I have to put my faith 100% in Jesus Christ and in the blood that he shed on the cross as payment for my sins. They don't like that because it does away with self-righteousness. But that's necessary for salvation. It is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. Okay, you have to get to that point where you die to yourself, where you say, I'm not good enough. Okay, there's none righteous, no, not one. All right, we are, all our righteousnesses, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says. But see, that's repulsive to somebody who's self-righteous, who thinks that they're a good person. But let's continue here. This whole notion of the rapture of getting pulled out uh, caught up in the earth, you know, snatched away, is also extremely dangerous because it is tied to a larger body of theology which is decidedly anti-Catholic. Amen. <laughs> uh, I'm anti-Catholic in the sense that I'm against Catholicism. I'm against the false system. Okay, I try to witness to Catholics, though. I, I you know, I'm concerned for their souls. So I'm not anti-Catholic in the sense of somebody's a Catholic and I hate their guts because of it. No, I'm against Catholicism. It is Satan's church. Okay, there's nothing more evil or wicked on this planet than Roman Catholicism. Um, and you can listen to some of my messages on that, too, for more information. But isn't it interesting that these people, all these false prophets, these post-trib rapture thieves, they all come to the same conclusions? And you have professing Christians that are coming to the same conclusions that you have to suffer and that Christians have to suffer, you know, and, they, and they're saying the same thing that Roman Catholics are saying. I find that kind of interesting. Okay, but you're going to understand if you read the book of Revelation, you'll understand why they try to get rid of the rapture, they try to get rid of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, excuse me, because Revelation 17 and 18 prophesies who... Roman Catholicism really is Mystery Babylon, and chapter 18 prophesies the destruction of Babylon. Okay, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's why they try to spiritualize it. Okay, Roman Catholic belief is amillennial. Okay, the events of Revelation happened way back in the past, and now we're in the millennial reign. We've been in the millennial reign since uh, after the first century sometime. <laughs> You know, it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And you say, well, yeah, well, that doesn't make sense, though, because the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ would rule and reign on the earth. Well, now think about that. What do Catholics teach about the Pope? They teach that the Pope is Jesus Christ. So that's why they are amillennial, because they try to teach that Jesus Christ is ruling on the earth in the form of the Pope and in the form of the church. See, it's, it's satanic heresy, absolute total heresy. And that's, too, why they teach, true Catholicism teaches that 
the Catholic Church is the only way to heaven. In spite of all the ecumenical stuff, you get down to their actual catechisms, their actual books, which I have lots and lots of, and I've studied them, they teach Catholicism is the one true faith, all others are false. And the only reason for the ecumenical movement is so that the Catholic Church can win the trust of the people, and once they have their trust and they take over, then they can slaughter anybody who opposes them. It's happened time and time and time again, okay? And it's going to happen again in the future. The Bible talks about that one day that they are going to, it says about in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble, that they will kill you thinking that they do God's service. All right, but let's continue here. The problem with the uh, supporters of the theology of the rapture is that they only recognize Jesus' teaching in the Word. Yep. In the scriptures, and I have to say, in an extraordinarily tortured reading of the scriptures, uh -huh. you have to go out of your way and make things up and twist things to such a degree and ignore, just totally ignore, other sections of scripture to come up with the notion of the rapture. Okay. Uh, who are the ones that are really twisting the scriptures? I mean... Twisting the scriptures into, into teaching that there is supposed to be the office of a pope who is forced into celibacy and, and millions of priests that are forced into celibacy, celibacy and, uh, you're to take sacraments and you're to eat the, the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ and, and, you know, you're to have nuns and monks which are also celibate and, you know, all this nonsense that the Catholic Church has and they call it divine tradition. That's why he said at first there that, you know, they insist that it's the Bible only, the scripture only. Yeah, yeah, we don't respect the traditions of men as in what the Catholic Church bases their truth on. Okay, and he says that they have to ignore other parts of scripture. No, 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 no. No, we don't ignore other parts of Scripture. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, you read through the Bible, and it's not that you ignore the four Gospels as a Christian in the church age. You don't. Okay, the things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. You don't ignore the Old Testament even. Even under the law, you don't ignore it. You look at it and you say, okay, am I supposed to be sacrificing animals like they did in the Old Testament? The answer to that is no. You compare Scripture with Scripture. I know that takes more work. And if you're lazy, that doesn't appeal to you. But the fact of the matter is, that's what you're supposed to do. You're to rightly divide the word of truth. And the Bible teaches that there's a second coming of Jesus Christ and there's a catching away of the body of Christ, the blessed hope. We aren't ignoring the second coming. We are rightly dividing it. We are saying, okay, I can see the second coming is in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the rapture is in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's called right division. Okay? And it's interesting because these guys, you know, what he's accusing Bible-believing Christians of doing, they actually do themselves. They ignore other parts of Scripture. They'll talk about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but a lot of times, you're going to see this in, in just a little bit, a lot of times they will ignore 1 Corinthians 15. Especially verse 51 because it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. And then goes on to describe the rapture. But let's continue. Next we're going to hear from a Greek Orthodox priest. Good evening. Uh, we have promised to say a few words about the question of the rapture. <laughs> it's a very strange doctrine that developed in North America. Well, perhaps in Britain originally, but uh, made its big splash in North America. <laughs> Okay, uh, problem number one with what this guy is saying, this thief, is the rapture theory developed in America or perhaps in Britain. Okay, now he's going to go off on uh, Darby, you know, and, and uh, the Plymouth Brethren and everything else, um, which is a lie. They're, they aren't the ones that started the rapture theory. Um, I covered this in my study on the rapture according to Rome, and uh, they... The Roman Catholic Church actually condemned the theory of the pre-tribulation rapture in 430 A.D. at the Council of Ephesus, I believe it was. You can listen to that message for more information. But 
even if Darby was the very first one to preach a pre-tribulation rapture, even if that was true, which it's not, but even if it was, that's not the issue. The issue is, what does the Bible say? And this guy, in his study, he does not deal with what the Scripture says. See, they try to make it about, this man started that, or that man started this. They don't deal with the Scripture, because they don't know the Scripture. But let's continue. Listen to what he says next. And it's a dangerous doctrine, and I'd like to explain why. Why? It's also, uh, well, heretical. In order to understand it properly, one has to go back a great distance and look, first of all, at the so-called millenarian or millennialist movements, in Greek called heliast. Uh, the idea of a special thousand-year reign of Christ followed by a thousand-year reign of Satan or a thousand-year huh? reign of Satan followed by a thousand-year reign of Christ followed by... Oh, whoa. Hold on there a second. Um, a thousand-year reign of Satan? <laughs> okay. Uh, could you give a chapter and verse on that, please? Uh, the guy obviously doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? There is no thousand-year reign of Satan mentioned in the Bible. It's a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. And it is mentioned numerous times, especially in Revelation chapter 20. Okay, the, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But let's continue, and we'll hear more about why the, you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Here we go. Continuing. Uh, some other event. In other words, three comings of Christ instead of just the second coming. There would be a second and third coming of Christ. All right. Here's another one of the favorite tactics of the lying thieves who teach a post-tribulation rapture or no rapture. They'll say, well, the second coming, you know, is, is clearly at the end of the tribulation. So if Christ comes back before the tribulation, you know, then it, that has to make the second coming the third coming. You know, ooh, I got him there. Uh, no, you didn't. Um, we don't teach that, okay? Jesus Christ does not come back at the rapture. He comes in the clouds and we go up to meet him. He doesn't return down and physically touch the earth at the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay, it's not the second coming. So there's no problem there. Okay, it's a mystery. Okay. Let's continue on here. In other words, rapturism is a cop-out from having to ever suffer for the faith the way Christians have done since the very beginning. Beginning uh -huh. with Apostle Stephen, the um, deacon. Rapturism is a cop out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm cutting out a lot of what he says too because it's just the same old stuff and I don't want to waste much time on it. You know, the Darby is the one that came up with the movement and then he gets into Darby also came up with dispensational teaching, which is a lie. Uh, there were some of the early church fathers talked about different economies, different dispensations. They wrote about it back in the first century, second century. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, then he talks about Christian martyrs and the need to suffer. Again, you have this, this pagan delusion that you have to suffer, that you have to play a part in your own salvation, which is ridiculous. Let's continue. And what makes rapturism so dangerous? Dangerous? Ooh. Is because many rapturists are... First of all, anxious to have the Third World War because they think it will pretty well force Christ to return or something. Uh -huh. And others uh, want us to show absolutely no concern and no care whatsoever for the environment. Oh boy. Because they say, well, before matters get difficult or anyone has to suffer, we'll all be raptured. We won't have to suffer, we won't have to endure anything. So the people who are left behind really deserve to suffer. And they deserve whatever catastrophes the environmental problems might bring upon them. So this resistance to responding to the tragedies of our day and this desire for a third world war, the Battle of Armageddon, uh, are part of what make rapturism so dangerous. <laughs> okay, so we're not worried about... Uh 
caring for the environment or social justice. Uh -huh. Well, that's all that the big churches are good for anymore. They're political. Okay, that's all they are. And by the way, if you understand the environmentalist movement, the whole green movement, I heard a guy say the one time that, that uh, green environmentalists are like watermelons. He called them that. They're green on the outside, but on the inside they're red. In other words, they're communist. Communism is, we want to take your land. They, uh, one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto was the abolition of private property. Okay, that's what they really want to do. If an environmentalist had its... If they had their way, they would force everybody out of the country and move you into compact cities and then slowly kill you off. Okay, that's that's the true belief system of environmentalism. Okay, now the Bible does say that we should care for the earth, we should be stewards. You shouldn't just trash the earth, okay? There's no problem there. But don't waste your time going out and protesting loggers cutting down trees, okay? That's stupid. Okay, but he says too, he says that we have a desire for the Third World War and the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 16 says, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Okay, the Battle of Armageddon is at the second coming. So again, he blends second coming with the rapture. He teaches somehow that we're looking forward to the Battle of Armageddon so then we can be raptured. That's nonsense. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay, the battle takes place at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, not the beginning. All right, and and I'm not I'm not oh I can't wait for war and worldwide destruction. That's a lie. Okay, why am I doing these studies? Why am I trying to warn people? Why do I have salvation messages on three different websites? Because I want people to get saved so they can get away from this stuff. I'm not I'm not looking for people to be destroyed. Oh, I can't wait for it. I'm saying, hey, man, you better get saved so that you can be caught up. Okay? Just incredible, the lies that these thieves will go to. But we'll continue here. There was, uh, I think two years ago, a video game, a rapturous video game. And it was a rather disgusting sort of video game mm -hmm. in which one tried to convert primarily Muslims by holding a Bible, and in the video game, the figures, or Christians, keep shoving the Bible at, at these people. And if one of them actually grabs it, then he becomes rapture-worthy also. <laughs> Sounds like kind of a good video game, actually. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, if a Muslim grabs a Bible, that doesn't mean that they're saved. But if a Muslim grabs a hold of the precepts in the Bible... If they grab a hold of it in the sense of accepting the truth of God's written word, the King James Bible, then sure, they'll get saved. Glory to God. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. Praise the Lord. It's great to see Muslims or Buddhists or, or Catholics or any false cult. It's great to see them get converted. And at that point, yes, they become rapture worthy. You're part of the body of Christ when you get saved. You're going to be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, this guy's a real problem with that. Continuing on here. And those who are left behind are subject to slaughter. A yep. bloody, hideous, horrible slaughter. Not by Antichrist, but by Christians and by Christ. And so it's a very dangerous movement, the rapturous movement. It's the kind of movement that can lead people to do something actually violent. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Going to lead people to do something actually violent. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, this incredible nut to say that Christians, Christians take part in the bloody, hideous, horrible slaughter. The Christians in Christ slaughter the poor people. How is that possible if we're raptured away first? You see, the guy's demented. He's got problems. He's got some screws loose in his head. We do not teach that Christians, we get raptured and then we come right back down during the time of Jacob's trouble and we go around killing people. That's nonsense. The Bible doesn't teach that. And by the way, read through the book of Revelation and yes, there is a horrible, bloody, hideous slaughter. And it's because the people have rejected Jesus Christ. And you'll notice too, time and time again, when God pours out his wrath, the people don't repent, but blaspheme the God of heaven. So they're worthy of what they're getting. The Bible says true and righteous are his judgments, referring to God. 
God knows what he's doing. Okay, the people that get judged down here, the people that are going through the horrible, bloody slaughter, uh, it's because it's their own problem. Okay, it's their own fault. If you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now, and the rapture hits later today or tomorrow or a year from now, and you miss it, then you deserve what's coming. You had an opportunity to get saved, and you didn't want it. Okay, it's your own fault. <clears throat> and he says, the rapture movement can lead people to do something actually violent. Uh, give me one proof of the pre-tribulation rapture belief system causing violence. Okay, just a total lie. Absolute total lie. Trying to, you know, scare people away from the rapture. I mean, what a, what a liar. What a false prophet. Continuing on. But suffice it to say, it's a neo-Christian movement mm -hmm. based in uh, a, a kind of um, triumphalism, triumphalism and self-centered arrogance. Ooh. People who think, well, I'm born again, I'll be raptured. Amen. I don't have to do anything now because uh, Jesus Christ was tortured to death to satisfy God's anger and justice, so I'll just sit here and wait to be raptured, and we don't have to do anything else, and we can just let the world go to hell in a handbasket, and it's just fine. That's the great problem with rapture. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm in full-time ministry. Okay, I guarantee you I'm not just sitting around waiting for the Lord to come back. I'm laying up treasures in heaven. And I know a lot of you are out there that are listening. You're witnessing to friends. You're witnessing to family. You're getting videos out. You're sending sermons to people. You're writing emails to people. You're, you're busy for the Lord. We're not satisfied to just sit around and wait for the rapture and let the world go to hell in a handbasket. The guy is a liar. And by the way, he makes that claim about Bible-believing Christians that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. But what about him? What about the Greek Orthodox Church that's more concerned with the environment, environmental preservation and social justice, you know? They're more concerned with that than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which they don't preach, by the way. Okay, Greek Orthodoxy is, is almost Catholicism. You know, I heard a guy say the one time they're basically Catholics that flunked Latin. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of truth to that. They have images, they have their huge big temples, they have system of works. It's a very wicked system. Okay, I'm going to actually end the study here. Uh, we're going to go to, I'm actually going to have to do a part three because this is running kind of long. So we're going to go to part three. Okay, welcome to part three. Uh, we're going to finish up here with a couple more of these thief recordings and I'm going to show you why they're wrong. So let's continue. Now we'll go on to thief recording number five. And again, I don't know the guy's name. He calls himself the Franciscan Friar. <laughs> and uh, if this guy doesn't repent of his sins, he's going to be a friar. Uh, <clears throat> so now we'll listen to the Franciscan Friar. Ave Maria. Welcome back to No Apologies. I'm Brother Joseph, and today we're going to take a look Brother. at the doctrine called the Rapture. Most fundamentalists believe that at the time of Christ's second coming, Okay, let me just pause there for a minute. The time of Christ's second coming. You see how these people do it? They just, they, they're such liars. They will say, the rapture, and, and, and it, it, people say about the second coming, we don't teach, I don't teach that the rapture is the second coming. Again, he lies. But let's continue. All those who had died and were saved will be raised from the dead, and together with all those who are then alive and who are to be saved, will be transported up through the air to be with Christ in the heavens. And then will come the time of great tribulation and the persecution of the Antichrist for a number of years, which will then be followed by a now public return of Christ and the final judgment. The rapture of the elect is taught from St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. In chapter 4, verse 16 to 17, he writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Okay. 
number of problems there. First of all, let me just read you the real scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, not a cry of command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Notice the Catholic Bible there, it says trumpet. Now, if you've heard the other study, you'll know what I'm talking about there. The trump is the sound of the trumpet. Okay, it's not the trumpet. Okay, that's very important. When you compare that to what John hears in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, he hears a voice, as it were, a trumpet speaking with him, saying, come up hither, and immediately I was in the Spirit. Okay, read that in, in Revelation chapter 4. Okay, but uh, it says here, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, let's continue. But the difficulty with this understanding of the rapture is it first closes an eye to the manner of our Lord's return. At the time which the rapture is supposed to take place, it says in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and with the archangel's Shout. call, Voice and of with the, the sound of the trumpet of God. Trump of God. But the Protestant rapture is always taught and depicted as something which is to happen secretly or silently. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Now, come on, you liar, you. We do not teach that. That is a lie. It's, it happens silently. I haven't taught that. Listen to my other studies. I mean, listen to the messages on the rapture. I do not teach that it's going to be a silent thing. The saved people are going to hear a voice, as it were, a trumpet. Okay, they'll hear the trump of God. And we're going to see about this in just a minute. And the lost are going to hear a voice that thunders. Okay, again, I'm not going to get into that here, but listen to the other studies. Okay, this guy's lying to prove his point. Where life is going about as normal, and suddenly, without any sound or any kind of warning, Liar. people just simply disappear, and those who are left are left bewildered, looking about for those who were taken. But that's not at all what St. Paul describes right there in his letter, where he will descend with the cry of command, and with the Shout. archangel's call, Voice and with the sound of the, of the trumpet. And the trump of God. Now, again, he's a liar. Uh, we don't teach that. Okay? And, and he had to lie to try and prove his point there. Uh, so, but who will hear the trump of God? John chapter 10, verse 3 through 5 says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Okay? At the rapture, you will hear the voice of the trump. It will call your name and say, come up hither, and you will go up. Okay? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. But now, when this happens, when we hear the trump of God, what are the lost people going to hear? If you're at work or something like that and you're the only saved person there and all of a sudden you hear your name and come up hither and it sounds like a trumpet and boom, you go up, what are the lost people going to hear? When they when that event takes place, I believe that they're going to hear a loud, explosive clap of thunder. Again, listen to the other messages. When the lost people hear God's voice in the Bible, they say it thundered. Okay? So that's what they're going to hear. They're going to hear thunder. So the guy's lying. But let's just say for a minute, oh, well, you know, the God will, is, will speak to lost. Okay, what's he going to say to a lost person if everybody hears God's voice? What would he say to a lost person? Sorry you didn't make it. You know, stay down thither. You know, <laughs> again, it, it just ridiculous. This guy's arguments just don't hold any water. Okay, now, next you're going to hear the poor guy trying to use second coming passages to prove disprove the mystery of the rapture. They they all do this. Matthew 24, they always go to that. Let's continue. And elsewhere, scripture speaks similar things in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Every one who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. 
Then again in the Gospel Matthew 24, uh -uh. verse 29 through 30. You see it? There you have it again. Let's continue. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Second coming. So our Lord is clear that His return will be no secret. Everyone will know what's happening. Uh -huh. And should the response to this be that these things which were just described will take place when He returns again after the tribulation, then it just needs to be pointed out that they are at that point contradicting sacred scripture by splitting the second coming into two different parts. Wrong. His coming before the rapture and his coming at the end of the tribulation. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Okay, we're splitting it. We're contradicting sacred scripture. No, it's called right division of sacred scripture. Okay, and the Catholic Church knows absolutely nothing about that. They pick and choose what they want and overthrow the rest with their divine tradition. But let's continue. But never in Scripture does Christ or St. Paul speak like this, but they only speak of a single coming which takes place after the Great Tribulation and which will be followed immediately by the final judgment. Okay, whoa, well, hold on a second there now. Never in Scripture does Christ or St. Paul speak like this. They they have to, to blend everything together. No, they don't. Okay? Jesus Christ is giving passages on the second coming in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And in John 10, it's very interesting. John 10, Jesus is actually speaking about the rapture. And the people have no idea what he's talking about. They're sitting around going, what? I don't understand this. Because they understood the passages about the second coming. That's written about back in the book of Joel in the Old Testament. Okay, so they knew about that. But when Jesus starts to reveal to them and kind of show them some truth about the rapture, which is coming, they're going, I don't know what he's talking about. It's confusing. Read John chapter 10 sometime. That's why Paul first reveals the actual catching away of the body of Christ, the rapture, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 58. That's why he calls it a mystery. Again, listen to the other studies. Okay, and he says, too, that the second coming of Christ is followed immediately by the final judgment. Again, he lies. That's not what the Bible teaches. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, you have the judgment of the nations before Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom. That's not the final judgment. The final judgment takes place after the millennial kingdom, after the final battle. Okay? where Satan is loosed out of the bottomless pit and he goes out and deceives the nations and Gog and Magog come against the city of Jerusalem and fire comes down out of heaven and devours them. And then you have the great white throne judgment. That's the final judgment. Okay? So, again, the guy has no idea what he's talking about. Which, you know, is standard operating procedure for Catholics. Now, another contradiction with the doctrine of the rapture, rapture is in the Gospel of Matthew, again, chapter 24, this time verse 22 through 24, which reads, And if those days had not been shortened, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, Lo, here is the Christ, and there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So just before Christ's return, these passages depict the great tribulation of the elect and that the signs and wonders of the false Christs and prophets are in order to try to lead astray even the elect. So, and then follows the text which describes the coming of the Son of Man. So the elect are on earth all the way through the tribulation and then all the way up to our Lord's final coming. Again, who is the elect? Who does the Bible say is the elect? It's the Jews. Okay, In the time of Jacob's trouble, God chooses 144,000 elect Jews. Okay, 
Read about that in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. They are the elect that God chooses. It's not Christians. Okay, I'm real sorry. But that's not the way it is. And again, you see the thief comes and steals God's promises to Israel. It's not the Jews that God seals. They aren't the elect. It's the Christians. You know, and in this case of this nut, it's Roman Catholics. Nothing could be farther from the truth. By the way, Matthew chapter 24, which this guy's quoting from, verse 16 says, Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Okay? The time of Jacob's trouble is about the Jews. It's about the nation of Israel. Okay? That's just the way it is. Continuing. So since these contradictions do exist, what then is the proper interpretation of St. Paul's First Thessalonians? Well, Catholics do believe that all will be gathered to be with Christ on his return. Those who are alive will either die and then be immediately be raised, or they'll simply be transformed into their glorious state and will be gathered with all the saints who are already with Christ. But the key is to see this being caught up to Christ and his second coming as one glorious event. So again... That's, you know, standard operating procedure for these lying thieves is they try to make the rapture and the second coming one glorious event. And it's not. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 through 18. Both mention the dead rising before the living and then the living going up. Okay. Please show me that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, or Luke 21. Show me a resurrection of the dead in any of those three chapters. It's not in there. Okay? Another thing, where does it say in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, where does it say that anyone is called up to the clouds? As it does in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Where does it say that we get called up to meet the Lord in the air in those passages in the, in the Gospels there? It doesn't. And by the way, if you read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, you will see that there's a massive sign that happens before the second coming. The sun is darkened, the moon turns to blood, and the stars fall from heaven. Now read 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and show me where that event happens. And show me, by the way, it says there in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, it says about in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's quick, it's boom, and it's done. Please show me that in the three accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Please show me where it's an instantaneous thing. It isn't. It's not one glorious event. I can't seem to get that through to, to people. You know, I've, I've had conversations with people. They just can't get a hold of that thing. Okay, they're not the same event. But now we're going to go to another recording by the same lying thief, the Franciscan friar. Ave Maria. Welcome Ave back Maria. to No Apologies. I'm Brother Joseph, and we want to make just a couple of final points in regard to the rapture today. And one scriptural contradiction of the rapture is that the disappearance of the saved is supposed to take place before the Great Tribulation and apostasy. Uh, again, <coughs> he has to lie to prove his point. It takes place before the Great Tribulation and apostasy. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what I teach on the pre-tribulation rapture. We are in the midst of the great falling away right now. Okay, again, the guy is a liar, just a total liar. To try and prove, disprove a pre-tribulation rapture, he has to twist what is taught by people like myself. Okay, just ridiculous. Continuing on. But besides directly contradicting scripture, it also does so in a general sense, where the believers are supposed to be raptured in order to be spared the great trials of the tribulation. But Christ was clear that to take up one's cross each day was the Christian's duty, and that he didn't come to take away our suffering, oh but he sanctified it, allowing oh. us to unite it to his sufferings. Oh, our suffering is sanctified, <laughs> and uh, we can unite it with his sufferings. You see, this guy's truly being honest about the thing of 
sacrifice. Why? Because he's a Catholic monk. And those guys do all kinds of weird things to, to help earn their salvation. And of course they go to hell and burn for eternity because they trusted in their own self-righteousness and not in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, But again, you see the true motivation here is a bunch of self-righteous people that, that I have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble so I can prove how spiritual and how righteous I am. Mm -hmm. A bunch of liars is what they are. Okay, let's continue on here. This is how the martyrs proved their loyalty and their love. They weren't raptured in order to be spared their pains. The saints which are described in the book of Revelation chapter 3 weren't raptured as the beast was persecuting them. They remained faithful in their time of trial and that's why they merited to have their father's name written on their foreheads. So thanks for joining me here on No Apologies. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. All right, buddy. Let me just give you some scripture, okay? It is disgusting to hear this guy talking about, oh, the martyrs. The martyrs suffer. Yeah, who killed the martyrs? Who killed the martyrs? Who was the one that murdered them? Who was the one that shed their blood? Let me just give you some scripture. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye then, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Okay? That's the verses for this lying murderer right there. His church, the Roman Catholic Church, is the one that killed the martyrs and saints of Jesus. And now they come out and they talk about, oh, the sufferings of the martyrs. You're the ones that killed them. Okay? It, oh, man, just makes my blood boil. And you say, well, you, you're not being very Christ-like. You should show your love. Uh, guess what? I just read the verse, the, those verses that I just read there, Matthew chapter 23. I was just reading the words of Jesus Christ. Okay? The Pharisees back in his day, the scribes and Pharisees back in his day, were going out and they were killing the prophets. They were killing those Jews back in the Old Testament. And then they built monuments to them. Just like the Catholic Church does today. The murderous, vicious Catholic Church slaughtered millions of Christians down through the centuries and now they come out and they, they have the nerve to talk about oh the blood of the martyrs and the martyrs suffering and ugh, boy it's disgusting I'll tell you what there isn't there isn't very much that makes my blood boil worse than that but we're going to finish up here um, with one more thief thief number seven kind of like the seven uh Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. We're going to go with one more vile, uh, lying thief. And I want to kick something else here, and that's why I'm going to play this one. And by the way, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, why didn't you pick, you know, some, some guys that are a little bit more on level? Why'd you go with Catholics and Greek Orthodox and stuff? Well, basically because if you're a post-tribulation rapture believer, these people are saying what you believe. Now, you, you might say, well, I take issue with that. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Greek Orthodox, whatever. But in reality, you do believe what these people believe. And also, I honestly couldn't find anybody that was really rational with the whole thing of teaching a post-tribulation rapture. So that's why I picked a lot of these people. But let's go on to the last lying thief. This guy calls himself Priest Kazak Yah Ben Yisrael. <laughs> And this guy is a nut, okay? I'm going to end it on this one to kick a movement and also just, you know, a little bit of humor here at the end. Let's continue. Shalom, shalom, shalom. I'll be straight to the point because I had some hate mail in my uh, box on the Rapture series, the Rapture teaching. Oh, boy. So I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, you ain't my brother. Rapture is false, fake, false, not real, Ooh. Okay. The only type of a rapture that you're going to see is when the Mashiach comes back and gathers us, catches us up 
to meet him in the clouds. Not in heaven, the heaven where Yah is, in the heaven, the clouds, to come back to do battle. Now, Zechariah 14 makes that clear. Let's look at that right quick. Zechariah chapter 14. Okay, now what he does is he goes back to Zechariah 14 and he uses verses. Again, the lying thief will steal things that God has for the Jews, the is Israelites. Okay, and now this guy, and I'm not racist at all, don't get excited, but this guy's a black man. And he's going around trying to say that he is a Jew and nobody else is. Okay, uh, he's a lying thief. Uh, that's what they do. Um Again, I've done this in other studies. You know, the Africans are descendants of Ham. And you're going to hear a little bit about this in just as we continue. The Jews are descendants of Shem, and the whites are descendants of Japheth. Okay, you can listen to other studies on that. But the whole point is to say that this guy is a Jew is ridiculous. Okay, it's it's as stupid as, it would be just as dumb as me coming out and trying to claim that I'm a Jew. I'm not a Jew, okay? I'm from Japheth. My ancestors are from Germany and France. I'm not Jewish, okay? So it would be a heresy for me to claim to be a Jew, and it's a heresy for this guy to claim to be a Jew. I don't hate black people, okay? I, I know people that are black, and, and I have people that I would consider a friend that are black, that are descendants of Ham, okay? I don't hate them because of their the color of their skin, but what this guy's doing is just ridiculous. But let's continue here. Of the Most High, that you do his covenant and not violate and say, I'm under grace. I don't have to keep it. Hey, I'm saved. I'm saved by grace. You're going you're gonna to be, that's an automatic entrance to the lake of fire. You oh. will get the highest degree for ignorance and stupidity and disobedience. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, you're proving your point there, buddy. You can't even get the word stupidity out. Uh, and you've you know pretty much proved that you're the one who's stupid. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Watch out for people trying to get you under the law. Verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Oh, I'm a Jew under the law. Okay, you're going to hell right now. You need to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith. Grace through faith. Not of works. Uh, Galatians 5, verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, Jewish, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Okay? And by the way, if you are a debtor to do the whole law, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn forever. Nobody can do the whole law. Okay? No one can live with the Ten Commandments and never disobey the Ten Commandments once in their whole life. So if you put yourself under the Ten Commandments as the means of salvation, you're going to go to hell, and you're going to burn forever. Okay, like this guy in this uh, recording. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And Paul was dealing with the Galatian believers because they were being fooled by Jews, in the tri and the Jews were trying to get them back under the law and get them away from the grace and faith uh, of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In other words, they're not trying to get you to become Buddhist or uh, Islamic or something like that. They're trying to get you. It's not another as in another religion. They're trying to get you back under the law. That's what's being done here. Verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. 
This guy's preaching another gospel. Guess what that means? It means he is accursed. He is condemned, damned to an eternity in the lake of fire to hell. Okay, this guy is a false prophet to the extreme. And you'll notice that he tries to go around saying Yeshua and, and Yahweh and all this stuff. I hate to tell you this, but Yahweh is actually a false god. That's not the God of the Bible, not the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Hebrews is Jehovah, not Yahweh. Okay, that thing is from the traditions of men. There was a, you know, I think it comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls or something. I I have a little booklet here, the Yuhu Yahweh scam. And uh, it gets into the whole thing of how Yahweh was created uh, by liberals and by apostates, basically to overthrow the Bible name for God, which is Jehovah. And by the way, if you have a new version, they will remove the word Jehovah out of your Old Testament. Okay, the King James Bible has that word Jehovah. Yahweh is not his name. Okay, that's a false system. And look out for people that try to start saying Yahweh and Yeshua and all this stuff. God never used the term Yeshua. Okay, you say, well, that's just a Hebrew name for Jesus. Okay, Show me the name Jesus in the Old Testament. It's not in there. And you say, well, it, but what about the New Testament? The New Testament was inspired, originally inspired in Greek, not Hebrew. So somebody tries to get you to go to Hebrew and you start saying Yeshua and you shouldn't be saying Jesus. They are lost and on their way to hell and they're trying to mess you up. Okay. And we're going to see that as we continue here. Go on to the next quote that was cast down was angry with the woman and went to make war with the woman the nation of Israel that's who you are African American you're Israel huh? you're not no African American African do a study on Africa and find out that Africa is a very very large continent oh good <laughs> it's a very large continent of course it is but the descendants of Ham are the ones that populated Africa okay and and you say, well, that's racism. That's, you know, you're, you're racial supremacist, white supremacist. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Hey, you know what you should do if you're black? If you're an African-American, you should respect your culture. Okay? You should want to know your culture and be, be proud of the fact that God chose you, that God created you as a descendant of him. Okay? That's not racism. That's not racial supremacy. That's saying, hey, God made me this way. I'm going to be proud of it. Okay, I'm not going to look down on other people that aren't of my race, <coughs> but this is how the Lord made me. And then if I do that, of course, you know, as a, as a white man, well, then it's bad. It's wrong. Uh, no, it isn't. Okay, God made me to be a descendant of Japheth. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to preserve that culture. I'm going to preserve that ancestry of mine. All right, it, it, it's just ridiculous. And I, I don't look down on black people or anybody else. You know, not at all. You know, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with some fine black Christians. And some of them are probably going to get there with more rewards than I will. Okay, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. But when you're down here on the earth, God made you who you are for a specific reason. God does not want us all to be blended together and to give up our culture, to give up our ancestry. God wants us to know where we came from and to preserve that. Okay, it, it's just, this stuff is just nonsense. But let's continue here. We're almost done. So which tribe are you from? You're an African American. Which one are you from? Yeah. We came through Africa, brothers and sisters. We didn't come from Africa. We came through Africa. Oh. Okay? There are people in Africa today. They're not Israelites. They're Africans. They are descendants of Ham. Huh? We came from Shem. Our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob was a man with Afroid features. <laughs> Okay, uh, what's your proof? He doesn't have any. Uh, okay, if Shem and Ham both have had Afroid free features, um, why is it that Ham stayed Afroid and Shem, I guess, stayed Afroid? Where did the Orientals come from? Where did the Jews come from? Where did the Indians come from? Okay, they're the ones that descended from Shem. Now, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And you take him and you put him beside somebody from Africa, they look the same. Okay, why? They're both descendants of Ham. That's your culture. That's your ancestry. And you should be proud of that ancestry. You should you should say, hey, this is the way the Lord's made me. 
Great. Fine. Wonderful. You know, trying to, to fake it and act like you're a descendant of Shem is just, it's a lie. But let's continue. And not knowing this, but the Israelites are not. Those Jewish people, the Jewish people, they are not the Israelites. You say, brother, you sound like you're anti-Semitic. I am. I am totally anti-Semitic. Uh -huh. But I am anti I am Semitic or pro-Israel, the true Israelite. Not the false imposters, but the true Israelites who have been scattered among the nations, who are always oppressed until the time of the return of the Messiah Yeshua. That's why we're not going to heaven, because he's going to battle these heathen nations, and he's going to use Israel as his battle axe to break the nations to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Laughter of a fool. Let me give you a little bit of scripture here, which this uh, nut apparently does not know. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Okay? Uh, Paul talked about them which are my, my, uh, my race, my kindred after the flesh. Okay? Paul was not a black man. Paul was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. Okay? That's just the way it is. And you say, well, then that's not fair to us. Well, yes, it is. Um, and by the way, let me just read two verses of scripture here real quickly. And I'm going to show you, if you are truly Jewish, what you should be doing. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are saved, whatever your race is, even if, you know, whether you're bond or free, whether you're male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. What should we call ourselves? We should call ourselves Christians. Not going around saying, I'm looking for Yeshua, Mashiach, and all this stuff. That stuff's nonsense. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? And it says in verse 30, or verse, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay? You are born in spiritually. You are grafted in as a Christian. You are brought in and given the spirit of adoption, the Bible says. But that does not make you a Jew according to the flesh. You are not now an Israelite. Okay, that's just heresy. It's just, it's just wickedness. But I'm going to show you what this Messianic Jew movement does. And I've seen, you know, there are white people that get into it. There are black people that get into it, you know, and they say, I'm a Jew. And they start to... They start to, first of all, it starts to affect their flesh. And they'll start dressing funny and acting funny. They put a yarmulke on their head and they, they start to grow their beard real, real super long. And they start to, start to grow their hair long. And they start to wear Jewish type clothing. And they, you know, it affects their flesh, first of all. They start to do outward things to prove that they're Jewish. And then they start to say, it's not... God anymore. It's Yah or Yahweh or something like this, which is heresy. That word's not a Bible word. It's Jehovah. Um, then they'll start to look at the New Testament and they'll start to say, well, wait a second. They were worshiping on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, but I have to get rid of that. I have to go back to the Sabbath day. Hmm. So now I have to attack those who worship on the Sunday. So then they'll do that. Then they'll say, well, actually, the Bible says Jesus Christ. Well, I can't do that, so I'll have to say Yeshua Mashiach or something like this. And so they'll start to depart from the King James Bible. And before long, they are no longer believing the gospel of Jesus Christ, grace through faith, not of works. They don't believe that. They put themselves back under the Ten Commandments. They reject the New Testament, and they reject Jesus Christ. And they go home to their home in hell, okay, with the rest of the people that are saying that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. That's where they head, okay? Um, I want to play here the last clip from this crazy nut, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about.
He rejects Jesus Christ openly. This brother's going around teaching that. Greek is a perverted language. Greeks gave us Jesus. The Messiah's name is Yahoshua, which means Yah is salvation. Jesus or Jesus is Greek pagan. And it's not the Messiah's name. And I grew up in the church calling him that pagan name. But the Most High removed that name off my lips. So now I'm trying to convince you to look deeper into it. Yep. And there you go. There you have your last recording there. That's it for the recordings. But he denies Jesus Christ. Okay? God did not use Hebrew to write the New Testament. God used Greek. Okay, and God has used the King James Bible more than the Greek and Hebrew original autographs. Okay, God has put his hand of his seal of approval or his hand of approval upon the King James Bible like no other version or Bible in history. Okay, Christians were persecuted and slaughtered for centuries, and the King James Bible brought us religious freedom and liberty. Okay, but let me just give you. Uh, some scripture here. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. What's the name? Verse 10, That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name is Jesus Christ, not Yeshua. God never used that name. He didn't write it in the Old Testament. And when he wrote the New Testament, it was in Greek. And that pathetic loser that I just played the recording of that said that that's pagan. Well, guess what? One day at the Great White Throne Judgment, that guy is going to be kneeling down and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's going to say, Jesus Christ, not Yeshua. Okay? I'm real sorry, but that's the way it's going to be. And I just want to say <clears throat> that you really need to watch out for that Messianic Jew movement. It's not of God. It's very wicked, and it will destroy anyone that gets into it. Okay, but let's conclude here. I'm going to read a couple of verses of Scripture, and then we're done. Uh, this study is kind of a long one, um, <clears throat> but let's continue here. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Through 32, I'm going to read these verses as a conclusion. You know, people say, "Why are you? Why are you doing this stuff, Brian? Why are you making these studies?" Well, this is why, right here. Take heed, there, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross is what purchased you, and it was God's blood, by the way. It's what it says there in verse 28. Look at verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. These false prophets are coming out of the woodwork. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And they're coming after the body of Christ. And they're trying to deceive you. They're trying to tear down. They're trying to take away your King James Bible. They're trying to tell you that it's not Jesus. It's not the name Jesus. It's not the name God. It's Yeshua and Yahweh. They're lying to you. God never used those terms to refer to himself. Okay? They're giving you the names of false gods to believe in, and it messes people up. They try to bring you back under the Ten Commandments. They try to get you to act like a Jew when you're not one. Okay? We're not Jew or Greek. We are Christians. Okay, verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That's what these people do, these thieves. They will destroy your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. That's what I'm doing right now. Okay, that's why I'm warning you. Because I've seen so many Christians, they get messed up in this the new versions That'll mess you up. They'll get messed up in the Messianic Jew thing. That'll destroy you. They'll get messed up in the thing of the post-tribulation rapture. And they start looking for the Antichrist. And how am I going to survive for seven years without taking the mark of the beast? And oh, what am I going to do? Oh, Yeah, mess you up. It'll mess you up and just destroy your walk with the Lord. You won't be looking for Jesus Christ anymore. You'll be looking for the Antichrist. Okay, verse 32. 
And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Okay? The thing that will protect you. I, I'm going to tell you right now, the apostasy is bad now. It's horrible, but it's going to get worse. And the longer we are here, the more you're going to see people falling away from the truth. And the only thing that can protect you is if you stay in the pages of the King James Bible. The scriptures that I've given to you, to you today, are you going to look them up? You better. You better check. Listen to the other studies. Whenever you hear a message coming out of Bible Believers Fellowship, you turn to those scriptures and you make sure that we're not lying to you. You say, oh, I trust you guys, you're, you're, you're good people. No, don't do that. I could deceive you just as quickly as any other false prophet out there. What you have to do is don't trust anybody, trust the King James Bible. That's the Bible that God uses, okay? And read that book, study that book. And if I or anybody else contradict that book, if I tell you something and you look up the verse and you say, wait a second, it doesn't say that. He's misquoting scripture. He's changing scripture. Then you mark me down as a false prophet. But if I line up with the book, if I line up with that King James Bible, then you better submit yourself, not to me, not to my teachings or to this church here. You submit yourself to God's word, to God's book. You conform to the King James Bible. If you are a Jew, according to the flesh, you read that King James Bible and you see salvation comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you get saved, you call yourself a Christian. You don't go around saying, I'm a Messianic Jew and I believe in Yeshua. You don't do that. Why? Because it's not founded on Scripture. It's not founded on the King James Bible. And you actually have to turn against the King James Bible to be one of these Messianic Jew people. That's why it's of the devil. Okay? And another thing I want to say is, you're going to have to stand your ground. All right, there. I have seen so many Christians that used to be King James Bible believing, believing in the rapture, looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ coming back, and now they don't believe that way anymore. And you know why? Because they gave in. They they quit reading the Word of God. They they gave up their faith in Jesus Christ's imminent return, and they quit. And now they're messed up doctrinally, and they're only going to get more messed up. Your only hope is to stay in the word of God, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's what it says in the book of Acts. And you better take heed to that thing. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready for his coming? Are you doing his will? Are you seeking the will of the Lord in your life? Are you going to stand firm in your convictions? And you say, well, but I'm kind of losing my faith. I'm, I'm been listening to a lot of things that are, you know, kind of putting doubts in my mind and stop listening. You know, there's this, this thing out there that we have to look at both sides. No, you don't. No, you don't. I've done a little bit of it here in this study, but I certainly would not encourage somebody to just go out and listen to false prophets all day. Nobody can take that kind of assault on their mind. You're eventually going to lose faith when you listen to false prophets all the time. When you see a false prophet, the Bible says you're to mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. That's Romans chapter 16. You are not to just sit around and listen to false prophets all the time. Mark them and avoid them. Okay? You better learn to do that. Because if you don't, you're eventually going to have your faith destroyed and you're going to give up. You're going to quit. Okay, so that's it for this study. And uh, you have to realize that this ministry here could eventually be shut down. I could eventually be silenced, uh, either by being cut off uh, from the Internet or, you know, I could they could get rid of me or something. You know, and, and you could be left by yourself. Are you going to be able to stand in that day? 
If everybody forsakes the word of God, are you going to be able to stand? You say, well, I don't know. How would I be able to do that? By believing the King James Bible? You know, I heard a story the one time. I'll close with this. I heard a story the one time how a man was taken as a prisoner of war. And he said that the only way he kept himself sane was by singing hymns quietly to himself and quoting scripture. You know, that convicted me because I said to myself, do I really know the word of God that well that I would be able to quote scripture to myself without having the book there in front of me? Do I really know enough hymns that bring glory and honor to the Lord and to his word? Do I know enough that I could make it through some tough times like that? And that should be a conviction for you too. Do you know God's word well enough? Are you spending enough time in God's book that if you were cut off from all other Christians that you'd be able to survive? Or are you, or are you going to be one of the ones that falls away from Jesus Christ? I, my prayer for you out there, the listener of this message, is that you take heed to the fact that there are many false prophets out there, grievous wolves, that have no greater desire on this planet than to see you like that false prophet there, the last one, this guy, that the black man that thought he's a Jew. He said, my purpose is to convince you. See, he's a grievous wolf. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your faith in the King James Bible, in faith in Jesus Christ, and in the pre-tribulation rapture. And those things all go together. So, that's it for this study. I thank you for listening. Uh, as always, stay in the book. Pray. Read your Bible. Witness to people that you can. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening.